Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Bob Jenkins, and welcome to the Atlanta Journal 500, the final race of the year. In about four hours, we'll know who the Winston Cup champion is for 1989. It's a very similar situation to last year when Bill Elliott came in here with the lead over Rusty Wallace. This year, Rusty has about the same amount of lead over Mark Martin and Dale Earnhardt. Now, Rusty was quite critical of the driving style that Bill Elliott employed during the race last year. The question is, will Rusty use that same style today? He has to finish 18th or better to win the Winston Cup. Well, Atlanta International Raceway holds special memories for Rusty Wallace, and for more on that, let's go to Pit Road and Dr. Jerry Punch. Well, thank you very much, Bob Jenkins. Indeed, they do. In fact, irrespective of what happens today, this racetrack in Atlanta will have a very special place in Rusty Wallace's heart. Let's turn back the clock a little bit. March of 1980, a young driver, 24 years of age, curly-headed St. Louis, Missouri native, came here to Atlanta having won the USAC Rookie of the Year title in 1979. A man by the name of Roger Penske said, hey, I'm going to give him a shot. I'm going to put him in a Winston Cup car. It would be his very first NASCAR start, his very first 500-mile race, and his very first look ever at Atlanta Raceway. Well, he came here and he qualified seventh. Very impressive. A lot of people say he wouldn't stay there. Well, he did stay there all afternoon. He ran with the leaders, and the man he chased most of the afternoon is a man who's starting beside him here today. In 1980, this man, Dale Earnhardt, won that race. Rusty finished second, and Earnhardt went on to win his first Winston Cup championship. So wouldn't it be truly fitting today as the decade comes to a close that possibly this man, Rusty Wallace, wins his first Winston Cup championship right here where it all began at Atlanta International Raceway. And Rusty, the big question now is how do you play it? When that green flag drops, what does Rusty Wallace do? I'm just gonna do be the best job I possibly can and do what I do best, and that's take it to the front, keep it there, be easy on the car, be easy on shifts, be easy on pit stops, but run hard, try to win this race. Be cautious around lap cars, just try to play it smart. Indeed, he's trying to play it smart. He will go to the front if he can. This is how he got to be the Winston Cup point leader by running up front, winning six events for the year. But if there's a problem, the crew of Barry and John Dotson, all the crew, Harold Elliott, Jimmy Maycar, they'll all be waiting to rebuild the car if they have to. They got a whole bevy of parts waiting to rebuild this Kodiak Pontiac. I guarantee you they're ready to make whatever changes they have to do on pit road. How about it, Dick Bergren? You're absolutely right, Jerry Punch. His responsibility today is to finish this race. And with that in mind, they've got enough stuff back here to rebuild the entire automobile. Front end components, lower control arm, and other things to rebuild the front end if necessary. A complete spare transmission ready to go. A complete spare radiator. They can't change the engine block, but they can change the cylinder heads if necessary. Here's a pair of them all ready to go in the box. New fuel pump. Remember Pocono. Rusty was leading when a tire blew out and wiped out his oil lines. Here's all the oil lines. A spare oil cooler. And remember Ricky Rudd at Rockingham lost his oil tank. Here's a spare oil tank. Spare rear axles if they need them. And in this box, the rest of the stuff to rebuild an engine and some more of the car if necessary. And it's sure the case that at least one guy won the national championship by rebuilding his car on pit road. Didn't he, Betty Parsons? That was me, Dick Bergen, in 1973. I crashed on the 13th lap, and it took the crew an hour and 15 minutes to bolt those new pieces on so I could go back on the racetrack and win a championship. But the thing I remember, it was the longest day of my life, just as it's going to be the longest day in Rusty Wallace's life. Because when he crosses the start finish line for lap one, he's going to say, lap one, lap two. And every time he crosses it, there's going to be some new noise that he hears and says, oh, man, what's falling off of it now? Matt, what's Rusty got to do to beat all that? Well, I think he needs to drive a little conservative here today, Benny, but we know that that's not Rusty Wallace's style. He's going to probably go flat out, as he said all along that he will do. Remember last year that he criticized Bill Elliott here for sort of stroking his way to the championship? Well, I don't see Rusty Wallace doing that today because uh, it's just not his style. Now, on the other hand, Dale Earnhardt and Mark Martin, it is their style, and they have no choice but to go out there and run flat out from start to finish. And if, so if Rusty Wallace was standing up here, he would have a red coat on where we got blue coats on, right? Yeah, I think that would be the case, and certainly if I were in his shoes, that's what I would do. But again, that's not Rusty Wallace's style. But Bob Jenkins, a million dollars at stake, it might change things. And the tension is definitely mounting on pit road as the engines have been fired and in just a few moments we'll have the start. This is the 296th race of the decade, but the only one on the minds of three men as they go for the 1989 Winston Cup Championship. Our Speed World coverage of the Atlanta Journal to introduce the starting lineup to you in just a moment. Points receives 330. Dale Earnhardt in third position received 225. 
Fourth position pays $160,000, and fifth in the Winston Cup points pays $125,000. And besides that, there are other monies to be... And our third in-car camera will be carried by the Skull Bandit Harry Gant, car number 33. There is the bumper cam that Harry will be employing for us this afternoon. Well, we understand that Bill Elliott might have some sort of a problem. How about it, Jerry Bunch? Well, actually, they did, they did get the problem corrected, but just a moment before they pushed the car on the grid, they, as they were checking the car out in the garage this morning, they found a broken brake caliper on the front of the car. Apparently, one of the wheels vibrating yesterday in the final practice session may have shattered the brake caliper, and an astute crewman here for the Mellon Course team found it, and they replaced it just moments ago. So Bill Elliott already dodging one bullet here at Atlanta Raceway today. All right, so we'll watch Bill Elliott's uh, early movement here in the race. Our crew cams will be carried by Sean Dotson and Robin Pemberton from the Rusty Wallace and from the Mark Martin crews. We'll be watching for those throughout the afternoon. We'll take another break just before the start of the Atlanta Journal 500. 59 Winston Cup season, there have been 103 different drivers compete in the series. Starting in the second row, two of those going for the Winston Cup. Dale Earnhardt will start on the inside in car number three. To the outside is Rusty Wallace in car number 27. Very fitting because they like to keep their eye on each other. And I think that we'll see them charge to the front, front as quickly as they can and try to pick up the five bonus points that are awarded for any driver who leads the Winston Cup race. You really think Rusty's going to try to lead this race early and get those five points? Yeah, I do. Really do. <laughs> oh, boy. If he should One. pick up... And he should uh, pick up those five bonus points, and all he has to do is finish 20th or better. But how about this guy, Mark Martin? Boy, he sure doesn't have a very good starting position. Qualifying just did not go well for him at all, and so he's got a real struggle on his hands here in the early going to get up front. Well, we had uh, anticipated a green flag this time around, but now Harold Kinder waves the yellow above his head, indicating that we will not get a start. And the reason is because Ken Reagan's car is stalled. Yeah, he had made a pit stop on one of the parade laps, Bob. They had the hood up, did some work under there. There was some smoke coming from his Jasper engines, car number 77, but he went back out on the track and apparently it died with him. Jerry, do you have a report on that? Well, we are being told down here that apparently someone noticed something leaking from beneath the Reagan car, and they thought it may have a water leak. It may have overheated or maybe just been overfilled a little bit, and as the engine began to come up the temperature, it may have been pushing some water out. So they asked car observers who are stationed around the racetrack, radioed back, and they had the Reagan car come on the pit road, and apparently that was the case. They had a little bit of a water leak. Now, we understand the car did leave pit road and then stalled elsewhere on the track, so he's already having his troubles here in Atlanta. The car is uh, stalled just uh, near the entrance to the pit area in turn four. So the start of the Atlanta Journal 500 delayed here because of Ken Reagan's stalled car in turn number four. At Atlanta International Raceway for the finale of the 1989 season. And the start is being delayed because Ken Reagan's machine came to a halt down in turn number four just uh, before he reached the entrance to the pit area. And it's still down there in that location. It has a tow truck behind it at the moment, but still uh, the car has not moved to this point, and so it's going to be a couple of more laps before we get a start to this race. Let's go to Dick Bergeron for an update. Well, it may be more than even a lap, Bob Jenkins, and apparently the brakes have locked up on that automobile, and if the car's brakes are locked up, they're going to have to do something more than just put a hook on one end of it in order to move it. Say again? We're going to put it on a rollback to bring it in. We can't push it right now. Well, that's the story from his crew. They're going to have to put it on a rollback, so it'll be a little while before we're going to get a green flag here this afternoon at Atlanta. Well, a frustrating situation for Ken Reagan, who lives in Unadilla, Georgia, not too far from the Atlanta International Raceway. And certainly, I know there are a lot of people here pulling for him today and very disappointing that it doesn't get a start. Now, this is interesting. These guys, Earnhardt and Wallace and Martin, have been waiting for two weeks since Phoenix to get this race underway, and now it's being delayed. What's going through their minds? Uh, two weeks. Rusty Wallace said it's been two years. <laughs> Every day seems like a month since then. And, and that's the same thing he's going through right now. Please get this thing started because once they throw the green flag, things will get better for Rusty Wallace. Right now, those butterflies are still churning in his stomach. During the driver introductions, I was standing beside of Dale Earnhardt, and he said, what time does this race start? They said, it's going to be about 1240. He said, what takes so long? I said, these introductions take too long. He said, I want to go racing. He was ready to go right there. 
Well, we want to go racing, too, but unfortunately, we're going to have to get Ken Reagan's car off of the apron of the racetrack before the green flag falls. And so, while we have the opportunity, we'll take another commercial break and be back at Atlanta. The Atlanta Journal 500 from pole position. The last two winners have started from the pole here at Atlanta. And, of course, if Allen can win, he'll take home $410,000. Let's go to... Uh, on pit road to Dr. Jerry Punch. Well, Bob, whatever happens today's Winston Cup point battle, the crews are going to be able to stare at each other all afternoon for 328 laps. I'm standing in the Rusty Wallace Kodiak pits where they're prepared to serve as that car. Adjacent to them, the Strode Light pits where Jack Roush is overlooking his team and troops ready to serve as Mark Martin. Beside them, the Jeff Bodine car. And the final pit here, just four pits away from Wallace, is that of Dale Earnhardt, the Goodrick Chevrolet pits where Kirk Shelverton and his crew will ply their trade. So all afternoon, the championship pits down here toward turn one. They'll watch each other as they come on and off pit road. Bob? And the 80,000 that have gathered here are on their feet now, watching for the start of this race. The pace car ducks into the pit area. The crowd cheers. They know it's the final race of the 89 season, and somebody's going to win a million dollars at the end of the event. And here we go. The race is on. points only one point separated them going into this race Al Kowicki our pole center went down in turn one the first lap got the car sideways almost crashed it and Rusty Wallace had to take evasive action to miss Kowicki then he, Alan told me during the driver introduction that he made a lot of changes on his car today he said he was not pleased with it yesterday afternoon in the last practice session he said we changed a lot of things I don't know what to expect Neil Earnhardt leads the Atlanta Journal 500 at the end of three laps and Rusty Wallace is in sixth place Mark Martin began this race from 20th position, and there he is as he tries to thread his way through the traffic. Amy Allison and Kyle Petty run ahead of Mark Martin. He's running 15th now, so he's picked up uh, five positions. Mark Martin running well. Certainly nothing conservative about him. He has a lot of traffic to contend with. behind Kyle Petty, who is right behind Brett Bodine. Mark Martin wants to go to the front, but I don't know if he likes following such a string of automobiles, but oh, this early, anything can happen. He's trying to take Kyle Petty, he's on the inside of him, can't make the move. Sideways. Rusty Wallace is in sixth position, 
looking for fifth from Darrell Waltrip. And Greg Sachs right behind Russell Wallace. Good run for him this afternoon in the Dunabell Pontiac. Greg Sachs began the race from 12 and now finds himself seven. And he's trying for six. He tries to pull alongside Rusty. He's not able to make the throw. Well, there are a lot of drivers out here that feel they have a lot to prove here this afternoon. We've talked about the championship contenders, but there are a lot of drivers that want to impress their sponsors. Some drivers without rides next year, so there's going to be a lot of driving very hard. Rusty Wallace has a lot of experience in front of him there with uh, Daryl Waltrip and Terry Labonte. Davey Allison there on the left, the right side of your screen, rather, battling with Jeff Bodine as they come down the back stretch. Davey had one of the fastest cars in practice yesterday and felt that he had a good shot of moving towards it. Darrell Walter was able to get by the 17 car of Darrell Walter. Looking out the back glass of the Jeff Bodine car to Davey Allison on the left and Greg Sachs on the right. While the race is being led by Dale Earnhardt. Earnhardt is the leader. He has pulled away to a pretty good margin over Kent Frater, who is running in second place. So Earnhardt charging hard as he usually does. He's about one and four tenths seconds ahead. You can see the difference on the racetrack. Earnhardt in the black car out front. Kent Frater in the red car in the right of your screen. Back in third position is Alan Kowicki. Fourth is Terry Labonte. And then fifth is Rusty Wallace. Darrell Waltrip. Sixth, seventh is Jeff Bodine, eighth Davey Allison, ninth Frank Sachs, and tenth is Derek Coates. While we're watching this action, I will tell the folks that Phil Parsons has coasted the Skull, the Crown Skull Classic goes mobile into the pits. And this is his last race for that team. It ends a seven-year reign with the team with Lou Bell and U.S. Tobacco. And we have a crash up in the fourth corner. One car spinning. Looks like Rodney Combs in the Evan Root Pontiac. Car down off the banking to the inside of the racetrack on lap number 11. The caution flag comes out for the first time today. Rodney Combs with some contact with the outside wall in turn number four. And the yellow flag is out. Well, he was running in a big pack of traffic back there and a lot of jockeying around going on in the area that Rodney was running. And evidently, a couple of them got together and Rodney came out on the short end. So let's see if. Dale Earnhardt will give away his track position and make a pit stop. Only 12 laps. What do you think, Dan? Is he going to stay out or make I a pit stop? I think he'll stay out, Benny. The, the tires that Goodyear has here uh, are a little reversed from some tires that we've seen in the past. We've talked about so many times that new tires run faster than scuffed tires. But most of the drivers qualified on tires that had several laps on them. And since they only have 12 laps on them, it's my opinion that he won't give up the track position. Now watch him come around and go into pit and <laughs> prove me wrong. Well, one thing that we've got to, got to take into consideration, though, they did run five or six pace laps. So sure. for fuel only, maybe they'll come in. We'll see. There's several teams has the pit boards out. But <laughs> again, maybe that's a ploy trying to get their other cars to pit where they're going to stay out. Well, we'll wait and see whether Dale Earnhardt will stay out and then uh, not give up that track position. Now, one of and the whatever he is, does, whatever yeah. Earnhardt does, will determine what the rest of them yeah, do. Right. And There's Cecil actually, Gordon. Yeah, let's watch him. I'll bet Earnhardt fakes coming in. Up there on, here's his pit crew, but I'll bet as they come past the entrance pit road, he fakes. Well, not too much. No, he stayed out there. And there they come. <laughs> no one is coming in. Everybody's staying out there during our first caution period of the afternoon in the Atlanta Journal 500. We'll be back right after this. Way in the Atlanta Journal 500, uh, there are 14 laps completed out of 328. We are under caution because of an incident up in turn number four involving Rodney Combs. Well, let's uh, go down to Dick Bergeron. Uh, we understand that Harry Gant was having some early handling problems. Dick, can you uh, update us on that situation? Yeah, Bob, the problem is the car is loose, so when he came in, they took a rubber hammer and they beat on the spoiler. They pushed it up some more so we could catch a little bit more air and help push the back of the car down. They also closed up the stagger a little bit. Gant had really counted on being able to charge today, but when the car is too loose, it's pretty tough out here with these speeds. So now that he's gotten it tight a little bit, watch Harry Gant start to weave his way through the field. 
One problem they've got, Dick, is all week, Friday, Saturday, it's been in the 40-degree range as far as temperature is concerned. Today, it's in the 50s. The warmer it gets, the looser it's going to get, and a lot of them are going to have problems this afternoon strictly because of 10 degrees of temperature. The green flag waves again, and we are back to racing on lap number 14. Make that lap 16, the green flag comes out. Dale Earnhardt leads it down. Built himself a pretty good lead before this caution came out. Now, Jim Schrader is going to be right on his bumper and trying to stay with him. Battle for six, not back there between Jeff Bodine and Daryl Waldrop. And also coming into the battle is Davey Allison on the outside in car 28. Boy, they're really going by. Look, Dick, Bodine, very, very high. Almost lost him up in the corner. Watching from inside the Bodine automobile. Bobby Hillen comes in for what we believe was a stop and go penalty handed out by NASCAR. Apparently, he, he had to he jumped the flag on the restart. And we'll watch for it. This is a replay of the restart just a uh, few moments ago. Watch the. Uh, there you can see him down on the inside, just coming out of corner number four, picking up a position before the line. And boy, it cost him a lot of positions having to come into the pits. And there's also a line down in turns one and two, the blend line that you can't move the car above, and apparently he did that, so he's going to be black flagged again. The battle now on the racetrack is for fifth position between Davey Allison at number 28 and Rusty Wallace at 27. Davey Allison started in 18th position. He has really moved through the pack. Car is running awfully well, but he backed off that time. He did not bury the car in there beside of Rusty Wallace. Maybe in March he would do that, but not here. The last race of the season when Rusty has an opportunity to pick up a million bucks. I'm sure Davey Allison doesn't want to be the guy that uh, hits Rusty Wallace. his car. He's in seventh. seems to be working well for him and that allows him to run hard and not take chances. Let's go down to Jerry Punch for a comment. Just spoke to Barry Dotson a minute ago. He said that Rusty had complained just a few laps ago about the car being a little bit loose and I think that's the same problem that we're seeing from Jeff Bodine and a few other drivers who did not expect the temperature to be some 20 degrees warmer today than it was when they qualified and practiced here in the past couple of days. A lot of people uh, have made such a car a little bit different and they're having trouble sitting a little bit uh, of looseness on the racetrack, maybe some uh, dirt on pile a little bit, and they're having to be very careful early on here in the early lap. So the handling setup could be something that crews chase all day long in this Atlanta Journal 500. You're watching Rusty Wallace, who is in sixth place now from the vantage of Jeff Bodine, who is in seventh. Say them dip uh, fairly low on the racetrack is to go into turn one and then drift out as you come off the turn. This is a true oval, short straightaway, it's only a quarter of a mile straightaway. Each turn takes up a half a mile. When you see the car 
cars go in the corner in Atlanta and move up the racetrack away from that white line, that normally means they are loose. If the car is tight or wants to push, you can run right on the bottom of the racetrack next to that white line. As we watch Rusty once again go in the corner, lets the car go up the hill and watch Code Eye come down underneath Wallace and trying to take that spot away. This is the battle for six spot. But Rusty having the momentum up on top of the racetrack was able to get. Oh, that time he just lets Bodine go. Basically, Rusty moved over and let Jeff go. He doesn't need to race side by side with anyone today. Well, you wonder how they gear the cars. Do they gear them high or low, especially those that are running for the championship? For more on that, let's go to the pits and Dr. Dick Burton. And it's a real difficult decision as to how to gear these cars then, Jared, because generally speaking, the higher the RPM, the more horsepower they get, the faster the car can go, and the more jeopardy they place the engine in. Now, Jack Roush said he's got to run real hard because they've got to catch Dale Earnhardt. So they wound it up to 8,500. That's his tack right now. That's about as tight as you'd ever want to run a Bristol Cup engine. Rusty Wallace has gone a little bit more conservatively. They geared for 8,350. Now, in the spring, they turned 8,000, blew the engine. They lost the valve. But last year, when they won the race, they wound it out to 8,500. So they've taken a middle point. Bernard, on the other hand, has taken the more conservative of all three. He's here at the track for 8,100 RPM, the same as he used this spring, the same RPM he won the race with. So three different strategies, all with the same thing in mind, win the race, win the championship. We see the tachometer, Dick Berger. Down in the corner, he drifts down to 6,800. And down the straightaway, it fills back up, 75, 76, 77. We can't see for Mark's hand exactly how far up it does go, but we see 8,000 we know he's turning at least that RPM. Now watch the footwork. On and off the accelerator. And you do have to decelerate going into the turns here at Atlanta. Back when I was driving race car, Benny, you could qualify and run wide open back then, but you're running too fast down the straightaway now. Mark Martin has Brett Bodine just ahead of him. As Mark tries to pick up another position. Speed Week this week, we asked for the second time in about a month, who do you want to see win the Winston Cup? And the earlier poll about a month ago was well in favor of Dale Earnhardt, about 62%. But in the most recent poll that we conducted among the uh, viewers who called in to our 900 number, Mark Martin had 42% of the vote leading both Dale Earnhardt and Rusty Wallace. And there is the leader of the race, Dale Earnhardt. We haven't mentioned him, but boy, he's got a good lead, Ned. He has four and four-tenths seconds on Ken Schrader. He has simply just driven away from Ken Schrader. And Terry Labadi is having trouble coming down the backstretch in the Budweiser Ford number 11. You can see their other cars just whizzing by as Labadi is going very slow. He was one of the favorites to win this race. Is there smoke coming from the car? Don't see any from the exhaust pipe there. The final the race, maybe. final race for Terry Labonte in this car. He won twice this year at Pocono and at Talladega, but he's headed for pit road here at Atlanta this afternoon. There's been some rumors about that uh, he might drive the 55 car, the Skull Classic car next year, but uh, there, I don't think there's been any official announcement on his plans, has there? No, they haven't uh, announced that, but that's the, the talk around the garage area that he would drive it maybe on it. 15 or 18 race schedule. It looks like it's terminal for Terry Labonte as he heads to the garage. So we put Terry Labonte's name on the list of those cars that are at least behind the wall, if not out of the race. Dale Earnhardt continues to lead the Atlanta Journal 500 with 31 laps completed. We're widening out here to show you the a tremendous lead that Earnhardt has on Ken. There comes Ken. But boy, I tell you, Earnhardt has a tremendous lead here. Second place, Ken Schrader. More on Ken, Jerry Punch. Well, I'm standing in the Schrader pits, and Rick Hendrick is talking to the crew here as they're trying to decide. Richard Broom is talking to some of the people about the possibility of a vibration in that car. As Schrader radio to Richard Broom, is the crew chief, said, 
TARDIS seems to bounce a little bit going into corners. They're not really sure whether it may be a spring problem, something with the sway bar up front, or something that would be something that wait and fix under a caution flag. If it were a tire problem, it's something they cannot wait on. They're trying to make that decision now. They really hate to come in, but they also hate to give up a race car and a good shot at a good finish here today. Action back in the pack. Brett Bodine involved in this action. There's Bill Elliott on the inside. Also, that's Dick Trickle, Gary Cope. And following there in the blue car is Mark Martin. Then comes Rick Wilson. Right, Rick Wilson, the orange number four, the yellow number four. And we see the high groove as being the preferred way to go for the drivers now, moving up high. Now, folks, as we predicted at the top of the show, we figured that Earnhardt, we said he had to go flat out all the way. Well, he's doing it. He's running over 170 and a half miles an hour. Now, Darrell, is that Darrell Walter for Derek? No, that's Derek Cope that's slowing down. Derek Cope has a paint job here this week on his Pure Later Pontiac. It looks very similar to Darrell Waltrip's paint job. But Derek Cope, who had a good qualifying run, the end of the pits here now in car number 10. Derek was running with that pack that included uh, O'Dine and pulls the pure later car into the pits for an unscheduled stop. They're changing rubber on the right side of the car. But on the racetrack, it is a lead for Dale Earnhardt in the Atlanta Journal 500 back in just a moment. Rona 500. After years of trying and many heartbreaks, Buddy Baker captures his first Daytona 500, driving for car owner Harry Rainier from the pole position. Baker won 19 Winston Cup events during his career, but only one Daytona 500. One of the biggest surprises of the early 80s, Terry Labonte in his second full season wins the Southern 500 in Billy Hagen's car. This driver-car-owner combination will go on to bigger and better things later in the decade. Throughout the afternoon, we'll be recalling some memorable races and moments from the 1980s, as this is the final Winston Cup race of the 1980s. Now, Dale Earnhardt begins to approach some of the slower traffic as he leads the Atlanta Journal 500. No, that traffic's not too slow. That's pretty fast traffic. He is flying. The car is absolutely working for, to perfection. Moving around Dave Marcus in the life boy Chevrolet, putting Dave a lap down, and Dave is running a pretty good pace. I think. Battle between the number 17 and the number 5 cars. Darrell Waltrip in 17 has jumped into fourth position, putting his teammate Jeff Bodine back to fifth. Looks like Darrell, yes, he moved back. He fell back a little bit at the beginning of the race, but now he's moving forward. I don't think he's running as fast as Dale Earnhardt. I don't think anybody's running that fast, but he's moving up. And look, Kyle Petty is moving. We saw him earlier in front of Mark Martin. He's up trying to pass Kowicki. It's a combination of uh, Kyle Petty moving up and Alan Kowicki going back because Kowicki has lost several spots in the last few laps. Yes, he has. His car is not working very well. It doesn't seem like certainly not the way it needs to be running the front. Now, Davey Allison has moved around Ken Schrader and taken over second place. Allison in the black and white number 28 Texaco car is now second. Ultra Chevrolet driven by Ken Schrader is to third. Unfortunately, Dale Earnhardt's car in. He's probably thinking he's leading the race by now. Davey Allison, great run going for the Highland Star for Thunderbird. And here's Davey Allison's progress. Started 17th, was eighth at the end of 10 laps, and is now in second. pulled out quite an advantage on Jeff Bodine. As Waltrip is in fourth, Bodine fifth. Sixth is Kowicki, and then seventh is Greg Sachs and Rusty Wallace. Now, look at uh, Alan Kowicki in the number seven car. He goes a little high in the turn. Bodine slips down under him. And this is not... Alan Kowicki is not getting through the corners like we normally would see. And look, he backs off that Bodine going up the racetrack he goes. And Dick Bergen is down with Paul Andrews. What does Paul say, Dick? Well, I'll ask him, Paul. You guys are backing up. What's the problem? Well, the car's a little bit loose. So we get us a pit stop here. We'll be in real good shape. I think we'll still be in good shape for the rest of the race. Here at KC Ford Thunberg. I think we'll do, do real good at it. 
Well, just about everybody is running loose. That's what we're hearing from all the competitors. What are you going to do to tighten this thing up, Paul? Well, we're going to put us some, put us some smaller stagger in the back and take, put some wedge in it. Yeah, they're all looking over the tire charts. So there's going to be some tightening up on Kowicki's car, and on the next round of pit stops, a lot more, too. And Rusty Wallace now moves to the inside of Alan Kowicki, coming off the fourth turn, turn looking for another position, but cannot make the pass. finishes 18th or better the championship is his there is the leader Dale Earnhardt and we'll zoom out once again and show you the lead that he has now on Davey Allison you better get the whole racetrack in this shot if we're <laughs> going to see the pentacle he has on Davey because he is really driving away He's up in three and four, and Dave is just coming off the second corner. His car is superior right now, no question about it. Now we saw Dave, we saw Earnhardt go by. Now we'll wait for Davey Allison to come by. He'll be along in a minute, folks. There he is. Hey, there he is. That's the lead that Dale Earnhardt has over Davey with 47 laps completed. Now. Darrell Waltrip on the high side of Ken Schrader for third position. Well, they said that Schrader might have some sort of a problem, and they're saying that it might be a left rear vibration, so maybe he has a uh, tire either going down or coming apart or something of that nature, but uh, he's not running as fast as he was earlier. And let's go to the pits of Dr. Jerry Punch, see what he knows about. We have been following the Schrader story, Dan, and apparently the vibration has not gotten any worse of, of what Kenny is telling the crew. They think that it may be a wheel weight that came off the left rear back there and is causing the car to vibrate and bounce. They're hoping to be able to make it another 10, 12, 15 laps, which would be their first scheduled green flag stop and come in and get those tires off. They feel like if he just backs off a little bit, which is what he's done here in the past 10 laps or so, and ride it out, maybe they can get in and get out of this thing without a major problem. All right, so Schrader now back in fourth position. And in about 10 more laps, these guys are going to have to come in because they're lead fuel. Yes, they will. They, they go about 60. Some of them might try to stretch it later on in the race to 65 laps. But on the first pit stop, especially they ran as many laps under caution as they did before, the green flag actually flew. So they'll, they'll come in at about 60, 62 laps. Riding with Harry Gann of the Skull Bandit. And here... Bill Elliott has caught Rusty Wallace. I wonder if he's, what Bill Elliott's thinking as he drives up behind Rusty. Watch him just drive. Oh, Rusty Wallace is slowing down. He's probably coming in the pits. Maybe not taking any chance on running out of fuel. We're on lap number 50, and here comes Rusty Wallace in for a pit stop. Let's go to the pit area, Jerry Punch. Well, Bob Dickens, you made the call. He's exactly what they're doing. They're not going to take any chances at all. And Barry Dawson just gave me the closed index finger and the thumb indicating everything was okay. They're just going to play it safe. They're going to come in and check the tires out. They are going to work on the right side of the car. Rusty keeps the car now wrapped up. Jimmy Maycar, the right front tire on. They are making a major chassis. Just been a little bit of cost fueling the car. The car is down and away. A little over 13 seconds, but they made a major chassis just to tighten the car up to the right rear. And, Jerry, you wonder if they got it full of fuel. Of course, at this point of the race, you're not quite as concerned about that as you would be later on in the race. But if the race goes green for a long time, it could make a difference. Now we understand that Dale Earnhardt, here he is, headed to the pits. Let's go back to Jerry Fine. Dale Earnhardt brings the good of Chevrolet. Likewise, he saw what Rusty was doing. He's not going to take any chances either. This championship is just too critical here early on in Atlanta. Now, crew going to work. Will Lynn, David Smith, Kurt Chevrolet, right side of the car. Chocolate Buyer, the first can of fuel going in the car. Nice clean fuel in there. Second can of fuel coming over the wall. They have changed right side tires. And now, they will come out the left side of the car and change left side tires. All four tires here for the Earnhardt crew. As he is still sitting on pit road there. Like he's not going to get any chance to 
21.4 seconds. Great pit stop for the Chevrolet led crew. That is some heavy pressure they're, pressure they're putting on the rest of the crews because if they change four tires, they're going to be out there with good tires all day. Some of the other teams are going to have to do that. If the caution comes out, somebody's going to get left. And he had a big enough lead, Benny, that he could change all four tires and still stay in the lead lap. So even if the caution comes out, we'll see other cars coming in. Let's go back to Jerry Fudge. Kenny Schrader's Folger Chevrolet is looming it out getting service on pit road as they are changing left side tires. And Jeff Bodine getting right side tires. Mark Martin's team getting ready to stand on pit road. Schrader is out of the way, and now Jeff Bodine is out of the way. And the big blue number six goes up in the stroll line pit as Robin Pimbert and the crew now await their driver. Young Mark Martin is starting way back in the field, and he is making his way to pit road. Alan Courtney makes his entry on the pit road. Let's go up to Dick Bergman. Kowicki's on his way in. The whole front of his car is sandblasted from running his traffic. He too will take tires on the outside. We're going to throw some cans of fuel in it just up pit road. The 28, Davey Allison, he's on his way in. Jerry Punch, what's going on with Mark? Well, Jack beneath the right side of the Mark Martin car. They are changing right side tires. Steve Mill changing the right rear. Robin Pembert in the right front. They also are making the chassis adjustment in the Martin car. Trying to get on the field with the car. He is now looking for Davey Allison fit with Dick Bergeron. Is to clean the windshield. He's been complaining about somebody in front of him throwing a lot of oil. He said he could barely see at all. And I can see oil on the front of the car. They've just changed the outside tires, thrown fuel in it, and off he goes. Green flag pit stops being made here in Atlanta. 55 laps completed. Here comes Daryl Waltrip. He relinquishes the lead to come in for a stop, and we go back to Jerry Punch. Jeff Hammond and the Tide crew trying to bring the man who won it here in the spring back up to speed. Darrell Walter Bob Pitt from the Tide Chevrolet. Eddie Dickerson has the right front tire peeled away. Hammond has pounded the jack beneath the car. They are working now, changing right side tires, and Hammond now will dance around to the left side, slide the jack beneath the car. Sandy Jones has the left rear tire off. They roll the left front tire to Dickerson. He puts the left front back on. Fueling is complete. He is now in the way. Great pit stop for the new world champion, the Tide crew for Darrell Walter. And Bill Elliott also moving out of the pit area after a pit stop. The new leader at the moment is Dick Trickle in car number 84. He has not made a pit stop, but we understand he will be in next time around. We're inside Jeff Bodine's car, and we're watching Dick Trickle to the left as he drops to the inside of the racetrack. And a spin in and turn number two, Greg Sachs in the wall. Richard Petty spinning. Several cars become involved. Another one hits Richard Petty. And the back stretch is littered with race cars. Alan Kowicki gets through, so does Ricky Rudd. But Richard Petty's car is heavily damaged. Now he moves it down from the middle of the racetrack to the inside. And another tough break for Richard Petty. Extensive damage in the rear end of the car as he drives it around. Yeah, he was just trying to get slowed down for the wreck that was in front of him and got tagged from behind. We see the rear bumper. He's dragging the rear bumper down the back straightaway. So it's our second caution period of the afternoon. This one because of an accident coming out of turn number two involving several cars, but all of them are able to keep going. Here comes Richard Petty now into the pits. Greg Sachs, who initially spun, is in. There's, There's Spencer's oh, car. Some major damage on Spencer's car. Spencer pulling behind the wall in the 88 machine. And the leader, Dick Trickle, comes in. Boy, this was a break for him because he was about to come into the pits. And uh, is now there, and Dick Bergeron is in that area. Everybody here has a grid on, including the driver of this car, Dick Trickle. They know what a break they have just gotten. The other leaders had to pit under green flag conditions. These guys have pitted under the caution, and they're going to take four tires. And meanwhile, Jerry Punch is up with Rusty Wallace. Jerry? Well, they are changing four tires on Rusty Wallace's car, but a mishap just behind Rusty that barely missed him, and that was Harry Gann, who just spun the car here on pit road and missed Rusty Wallace. The crew cam now on John Dawson showing those left rear lug nuts going on. Wallace leaves, and Jeff Bodine comes on the pit road as everyone takes advantage of this constant flag. So a caution flag and more pit stops here at Atlanta International Raceway.
is back on the lead of the, of the Atlanta Journal 500. I think appears to be is the operative <laughs> word here because folks, I don't have a clue who's leading this race. Well, he, he stayed in the lead lap when he made his green flag pit stop. Let's go to the pits and Jerry Punch. Well, Harry Gant is leaving the pits, Ned. We just might uh, sort of tell you what happened. That was a near miss for Rusty Wallace. Harry Gant had come in to make his pit stop as he was ex exiting pit road. Bill Elliott was coming in, and Gant slammed on the brakes. Now, if you look at pit road, there's a strip of concrete, which is against the pit wall, and that abuts the asphalt. As the cars almost touch, Gant jumps on the brakes, and that concrete will allow the rear end of the car to slide. He slides the car. He probably is no more than 15 feet behind where Rusty Wallace was pitting his car. So a near miss for Elliott Gant, and of course the man who wants to win it all, Rusty Wallace. And there was also a near miss for Mark Martin as he almost nailed uh, Rick Wilson coming into the pits. That was during a green flag pit stop. Still under yellow here at Atlanta. Cleaning up an accident over in turn number two. We'll be back with more right after this. Track facts are brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil. The big Q stands for quality. Always has, always will. In the last couple of months, we've had drivers complain about the lockers not working momentarily. We're going to try to explain to you what happened. Here's the locker inside the rear end or third member of the automobile. Here's the locker broken apart. These springs hold these gears together. What happens occasionally is that the gear will come out and ride up on the other gear. Therefore, the locker doesn't work. When the driver backs off the gas, it pops back into place. It's working again. Most of the time, these things work perfectly, but once in a while, not correctly. Well, not only can he drive a race car, but he can explain all kinds of mechanical problems. We'll be back with more of the final race of 1989 in just a moment. The race is about to restart after our second caution period of the afternoon. There is part of the 80,000 people that have gathered here for this final Winston Cup race of 1989. There's the green flag. Back to racing on lap 64 with Dale Earnhardt leading and Rusty Wallace one lap down. would like to get his lap back. There he goes to the inside of Darrell Waltrip, who is also one lap down. Rusty, at the moment, is running in 15th position. And fans might wonder how he got a lap down. As a result, Dick Trickle had not made a pit stop before the caution came out and taken the lead. Most of the other cars had made pit stops. Some of them got out quick enough that they stayed in the lead lap, but don't think Rusty Wallace did. Or on that, let's go to his very much. We're standing out with Barry Dodson, and Barry, you've been discussing with NASCAR about being a lap down. How do you see this? Uh, evidently, we are. It was, I tell you, it's confusing right after everybody makes a stop, and then you stop. So we're just going to go along with them right now. Everything's good. Okay, they're going to accept what they've got. They've won here before from coming a lap or two down. They're not really concerned about it right now. Well, it's definitely early in the race, and a lot of time can be made up. Mark Martin in car number six is running in second position. And he is in second spot. He is not a lap down. The 17 car, Darrell Walter, the orange and white car behind Mark, is a lap down. And the 84 car right behind Darrell Walter, Nick Trickle, is in the lead lap. He is in third place. Now. And Greg Sachs had a good car to bump him up in turn four, very high. He drove it up there. He's, he, he didn't uh, actually hit the wall. He went up there. Oh, Ooh, boy, he's about to hit somebody else as he came down across the track, though. Yeah. He had a problem going down the back stretch, and the cars passed him on the inside, and they went high into the turn and then dipped down into the pits. That was Ken Reagan that just missed him. I had a heart attack going on. Oh, that, that, that was scary. Evidently had a tire to go down with the Dinnerbell Pontiac. Greg was uh, responsible for the initial uh, second caution flag. There he is sliding up high on the racetrack in turn number four, getting up into the marbles. And watch as Ken Reagan just wow. misses him. He deserves the cool move of the race. Man. Ken Reagan does. Let's go to Nick Bergman on pit road. Well, a tough break for Greg Sachs. He started in 12 spot and worked himself all the way up to six before that problem happened. Right now, he's taking a four-tire change under the green. They sense a tire problem. They're going to make sure they've got it resolved by changing all four of them. Wallace is going on. Everybody else is going 170 miles an hour, and Earnhardt puts him a lap down. Dale 
Earnhardt leading. And look at this scramble for position. Sterling Marlin, Ken Schrader, Davey Allison, and Kyle Petty. Here comes the number seven car of Alan Kowicki. Now, remember that Sterling Marlin started shotgun on the field as a result of having to go to his backup car, and here he is running at the top five. And Alan Kowicki, a pole sitter, who had a chance to pick up the Unical bonus of $410,000, is not in the top 20. He is a lap down because he had a, a green flag pit stop and had trouble putting fuel in the car, and he spent a lot of time in pits and therefore a lap down. And so is Rick Wilson, the number four in the orange car. Jeff Bodine coming in to the picture is in the lead lap. Those that have dropped out of the race include Rodney Combs, Terry Labonte, and Mickey Gibbs. Mickey Gibbs announced this week that he's going to be back running Winston Cup next year with Days In, the motel chain, as a sponsor. Bill Parsons and Jimmy Spencer also out of competition here in the early going of the Atlanta Journal 500. And, of course, the more cars that drop out of this race, Bob, that works to Rusty Wallace's advantage. Uh, he still, at this point, has to finish... Well, right now, I think it's about uh, 20, no, 18th there or better right. to clinch the championship. But the more cars that fall out, the better chance that gives him to win again. Yeah, if he were to lead a lap, and he has not done so yet, then he would have to finish 20th or better. But right now, he has to finish 18th or better. Rick Wilson on the outside of Jeff Bodine. This is not a battle for position because Wilson is a lap down. Jeff Bodine on the lead lap. But that is a battle for a position right in front of him. Here's Mark Martin moving around to Rusty Wallace, or trying to, and looks like he's going to do it. He puts him a lap down. Of course, he was already a lap down to Dale Earnhardt. But now that's, that's even more nails in the coffin because now if Earnhardt should have a problem, Mark Martin still has Rusty a lap down. Now, that battle we were talking about is for position is the car number 28 of Davey Allison and the car number 94 of Sterling Marley. And a recheck of NASCAR scoring indicates that Mark Martin is also a lap down. What? That's what they tell us. Well, that, that could be, because he was one of those drivers that was uh, over a half a lap behind Dale Earnhardt, and Dick Trickle was still running at a very good pace when he took the lead as a result of not having made a pit stop, so it's possible that he is a lap down. Alan Kowicki, the pole sitter, the only one going into this race eligible for $205,000 in bonus money from Unical and two hundred five dollars from the racetrack. Any pressure knowing that you could win a half million dollars here? Well, I don't know about special pressure. You know, for weeks, everyone's talking about the championship and who has a chance at it and a million dollars. Well, the difference between first and second for the championship is about $700,000. We stand to win about a half a million here. So uh, it's certainly plenty incentive for our team. You know, I, I think we've got as much at stake today as anyone does. Well, indeed, they do. However, Allen is a lap down now and has a long road ahead of him to get up into the lead lap and be eligible money. Alan Kowicki almost his day almost ended because he and Davey Allison were just millimeters apart up in the corner and they seemed to get together just momentarily because Jeff Bodine blew by both of them and went on. Well, fellas, we're only showing 12 cars in the lead lap right now for Dale Earnhardt leading or he's at 11. Yeah. With Dale Earnhardt leading and Dick Trickle running second. Third is Sterling Marlin. Now Kenny Schrader running third. Sterling Marlin fourth and Davey Allison in the fifth position and in sixth is Jeff Bodine, seventh Neil Bonnet, Lake Speed is eighth, ninth is Ricky Rudd, tenth is A.J. Foyt, and eleventh Dave Marcus. Now, those last five cars that I mentioned, Neil Bonnet, Lake Speed, Ricky Rudd, A.J. Foyt, and Dave Marcus all pitted on that first caution when the others didn't come out. That allowed them to keep going. They didn't have to make that green flag pit stop. As a result, they're in the lead lap. It was a very significant moment in the race, at least in the first uh, 77 laps. The fact that we had uh, several green flag pit stops, then a caution, and several others then coming in during that caution period to get their pit service. And one thing to let those five drivers get back in the lead lap was Earnhardt changed four tires on his caution plan. The number 94 car, Sterling Marlin, the five of Jeff Bodine, and the 28 of Davey Allison are all racing for position. Brett Bodine is in the pits for an unscheduled pit stop. Right side tires going on the Motorcraft Ford. Here comes Davey Allison moving inside of Jeff Bodine off the fourth corner as Brett Bodine goes back out onto the racetrack. You can see Ken Reagan's car still on pit road as they do work on that machine. Davey's car not able to stick on the bottom of the racetrack. 
when you go in the corner here, you need to let the right side of the car lean against the air that's out there. When you get alongside the car, they take that air away. It makes the car get awfully loose, and you want to lose the back end. So you don't want to drive underneath someone going in these corners, one and three, here in Atlanta. And if anybody can speak on how to drive this racetrack, it's Benny Parsons. This was one of your better racetracks. It was a racetrack that I truly loved. Over the the lead of the Atlanta Journal 500 is held by Dale Earnhardt, and there he is, just running away from everybody. That car just set up very, very well. More from Dr. Jerry Punch. Just before the race began, I was standing there talking to Rusty Wallace on pit road, and Dale Earnhardt motioned to me to come over to his car. He said, hey, Dr. Me, I want to show you something. He leaned over and showed me, said, I want to see my good luck chart. Taped to the roll bar right to his right side, just about the shifter, was a gold medal. Looked like something you'd see in the Olympics. He said, that's exactly what it is. I was in Richmond, Virginia, doing a personal appearance for the Special Olympics not long ago, and he met a lot of nice friends up there. One young man by the name of Stro Schorler from Richmond, Virginia, won that gold medal in the roller skating division of the Special Olympics. He sent it to Dale Earnhardt, and maybe it'll bring you the same kind of luck it brought me. Dale was so touched for this, he took it to the roll bar and said, every time we get a yellow flag, I'm going to take my right hand to the and grab that gold medal, and maybe I'll come home and win this thing, and maybe the Winston Cup championship. Very interesting story from uh, Jerry Punch regarding a good luck charm inside the car of Dale Earnhardt. Well, he's doing exactly what Rusty Wallace did last year. Rusty knew that he had to, to go out and run as hard as he could, lead as many laps as he possibly could, and try to win the race. That's what Dale Earnhardt, the only thing short of what Rusty did last year, Earnhardt didn't win the pole where Rusty did last year. Now, there is Rusty Wallace, who is the second car behind Dale Earnhardt, but again, Rusty is one lap down. The second place car is driven by Dick Trickle, car number 84. We have completed 83 laps of the Atlanta Journal 500 from Atlanta International Raceway, and we'll be right back. set out to engineer the ultimate spark plug. We put in a lot of long hours. We utilized a lot of revolutionary thinking. And all the while, our competition thought we were just shooting for the moon. Unfortunately for them, we shot a bit higher than that. Bosch Platinum, the ultimate spark plug. Available at Kmart and other fine auto parts stores. Installed at most precision tune centers. some steaks and gets the queen a butt light. Oh. For clean, fresh taste, one light outshines them all. Butt light. Henry, they're pop tops. Because everything else oh. is just a light. From dawn's early light till the sun is set. Quaker State and you don't know when to quit. Quaker State exceeds every single car maker's U.S. requirements for maximum engine protection. That's why in Atlanta, Georgia, the engine in every fire truck, every police car, every Atlanta city-owned vehicle is a Quaker State engine. The big Q stands for quality. Always has, always will. The caution is out and pit stops are being made on lap number 84. The reason for the caution, some debris on the backstretch that they are retrieving right now. Well, we've tried for 84 laps. We finally got a different leader. Dale Earnhardt is not leading the race right now. And this is why. Look at the scramble out of the pit area. That's Ken Schrader pulling out first. The Bolger Chevrolet crew does a good job. He gets out first. Here comes Earnhardt. And so the guy who started in second position outside of row number one, Ken Schrader, is the leader of the race as we well, go back. Nope, I think Ricky Rudd stayed out and did not make a pit stop. He's the leader in the Quaker State Buick, and A.J. Foyt currently running in second position. So 
I guess he stayed out there for track position, or maybe he's coming <laughs> well, in now. It's all for naught because here comes, here comes uh, Ricky Rudd in for a stop. And how well, about Foyt? It might not have been for naught as far as uh, Ricky Rudd's concerned. He is in a tight battle for points back in the field, and that five bonus points that he got by leading a lap here could make the difference in several thousand dollars. Let's, go to, let's go to Dick Bergman on pit road. Well, this is a break these guys have needed all weekend. They've had a tough time getting this car to run fast. They qualified well in the back of the pack. This is something that they really hadn't anticipated running up front, but who knows? You never want to count this team out. They do not give up ever. Right now, they're taking on four tires as the whole pack goes on by. A four tire change is over, and Rudd is on his way out to the racetrack. And so the leader is A.J. Boyd. Back from his injury that he sustained at Charlotte a few weeks ago. You know, I talked to A.J. about that accident and said, how you feeling, what have you? He said, you know, I've crashed many, many times in my career. That's the first time I've ever crashed, and I don't remember what I, I don't remember the crash. Have no idea how he crashed or any, he doesn't remember anything about that whole day. But Super Tex shook off the injuries and is back in competition and in the lead of the Atlanta Journal 500. Back in just a moment. More police cars come on Goodyear Eagle radios than any other brand of tires. Why? Because they want it that way. Goodyear Eagles, there really is a difference. You know, Rusty's so extremely talkative, and some people think I'm the quiet one. It's just that Xerox antifreeze coolant appeals to my calm, cool demeanor. It protects my engine in extreme cold, down to 84 below. Now, I'm sure if Rusty could, He'd go on and on about how Xerox protects an extreme heat, up to 276 degrees. But he graciously suggested I do this spot alone. Mm -hmm. Right, Rusty? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Xerox antifreeze coolant, because extreme conditions demand extreme protection. The 1989 Winston Cup Championship is on the line today at the Atlanta Journal 500. Live here on ESPN from Atlanta International Raceway. Our Speed World coverage is being brought to you by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? By Xerox, the antifreeze coolant for extreme conditions. And by Budweiser, Beachwood aged for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. Top 10, A.J. Boyd is the leader, Ken Schrader second, followed by Dale Earnhardt, Dick Trickle, and Jeff Bodine. Six through ten, Davey Allison, Lake Speed, Sterling Marlin, Neil Bonnet, and Ricky Rudd. 86 laps are completed, and the field is about to go back to green. Boy, look at this crowd down here. There are three abreast coming off of the turn. They're not supposed to be that way. Let's see what uh, is going to happen. They're giving the green flag. And Somebody's going to get black flag. Yeah, one of the middle guard down on the inside is Bobby Hill, and he's already been black flag for or jump the flag a little bit earlier. We'll see what happens this time. He's also a black flag for one at the entry line back on the racetrack, so if he does get black flag, it would be the third time this race. Here comes A.J. Point down the back stretch. That car alongside of him is driven by Ernie Irvin, number two. Ernie won. No, he just blew everybody away yesterday in the ARCA race here in Atlanta. Well, evidently Bobby Hill got back in line in time that uh, they're not going to give him a get-back flag. Look at Earnhardt go way inside, off the corner to the long side. Morgan Shepard. And Rusty Wallace is going to try to follow Earnhardt by. He makes it by Morgan, but he's alongside A.J. Point now as they go down the back straightaway. I tell you, it's just amazing what Dale Earnhardt go through a pack of cars. It, it looks like that he's driving reckless, but it, you know, he just gets through there with he knows what he's doing. He has a lot of confidence in the way he does it. Earnhardt just drives alongside Ernie Irvin and goes by him as he exit turn four. And puts Dale Earnhardt in the lead once again. We're watching from Mark Martin's car. H.A. Point to the right. That is Morgan Shepard just ahead in car number 75. Martin trying to get alongside, pulls up on the left rear as they go down to turn three. Mark is a lap down, don't forget. He and Rusty Wallace both lost laps. 
Morgan Shepard almost oh, loses boy. it up in the fourth corner. He got way up at the marbles in turn number four. He lost several positions as a result. Bill Elliott coming into the pits, an unscheduled pit stop for Bill Elliott. Apparently has a right side tire going flat. Jerry Punch. You think they may have a tire going flat, Dan, and Elliott is coming on the pit road. And likewise, Rusty Wallace has called his crew and said, I think I'm going to be coming in too. They are out on pit road looking for Rusty as they move around to the left. Rusty Wallace is now slowing down and he will be headed for pit road as Bill Elliott now gets left side tires on his course for the Pontiac of Rusty Wallace making his way to the pit as Elliott is leaving pit road. The crew now, the Kodiak crew, watching and waiting. Rusty must think he may have a tire going down there. going to look at all four tires. Harold Elliott starts patting the left front and he pats the left rear. Meanwhile, they're checking the right side. They will change the right side tires and fuel the car. Another tough break for the Kodiak Pontiac driver. A little over 11 seconds, and they are down and away. Tough break for Wallace and Elliott. But is going to lose another lap? Let's see. Here comes Dale Earnhardt racing toward turn number one. There you see him. Rusty trying desperately to get the car back up to speed, staying on the apron of the racetrack so he doesn't move above that blend line. But he'll and not be he able goes, to do it. Goes two laps down. He had to stay below that line, and it took a while to get the speed up, and Earnhardt had his speed up already. It was a fantastic pit stop. It still was not good enough to keep him going a lap down. A few laps ago, Morgan Shepard almost went into the wall. Well, he just simply drove the car in the corner so hard it wouldn't stick. He gets a little bit out of shape, and up the hill he goes. Ooh, very, very close. Close call for Morgan Shepard, but he saved it. Well, now, fellas, with Rusty Wallace being two laps down, you know, before he had to make that unscheduled pit stop, he was, at that time, was still be in position to win the Winston Cup championship if the race had ended then. But right now, he wouldn't be in that position. And you know Dale Earnhardt, he came into this race, as far as uh, I can determine, with with the attitude that, hey, this is, this is my kind of race. I've got to win it. I've got to run just as hard as I possibly can all afternoon, and that's exactly what he's doing. There's no pressure on him, really. There is no pressure. Look at his windshield. We see the heavily tinted windshield on the right side, the glass on the left side. That's because this afternoon, about 4.30, the sun going to turn three in Atlanta is absolutely miserable. The darkest windshield is possible. Well, let's get more from Dr. Jerry Punch. The driver meeting this morning, Dick Beatty reminded all the competitors exactly what you were talking about. At about 3.30 or 4 o'clock, going into turn three, they will not be able to see because the sun will be so low, it will be a lot of glare. Now, you are allowed to put tape on the inside of the windshield before the race starts. You cannot put tape on the outside of the windshield until later on in the race when they have a lot of problems with the sun. So, a lot of, long, later on in the afternoon, they'll have a lot of drivers putting tape on the outside of the windshield when that problem occurs. One driver that will not have to worry about that apparently is A.J. Floyd as he has pulled to his garage area and may be calling it quits. Now, Rusty Wallace is running really well. He just passed Ken Schrader and now sets his sights on Dale Earnhardt in an attempt to get back one of his two laps. He, we're going to find out just what kind of race car that Rusty Wallace and Dale Earnhardt has right now because Rusty has got to get a lap back if he's going to win this championship. Yeah, he has no choice but to push it as hard as it will possibly go right now. This is how he passed Ken Schrader, who's running in second position as Bill Elliott comes back into the pit area. This is Rusty Wallace moving to the inside of Ken Schrader at the end of the backstretch and successfully passing him. Now let's go back down to Jerry Punch in the Bill Elliott pit. Another tough break for Bill Elliott. He radioed in and says something sounds like it's a miss in the engine. And sure enough, when he came down pit road, the Coors Motorcraft Ford was sputtering. And they now have the hood up. Ernie Elliott is leaning over, looking inside the car at the gauges, and now talking to Bill Elliott as they are looking in the area of the distributor and some of the ignition parts on the right side of the motor. So Elliott sitting here quietly in the pits. The engine has been shut off as Dale Earnhardt goes by one more time and puts another lap down. Sits helplessly in the pit area. He, of course, won the most recent Winston Cup race at Phoenix International Raceway just two weeks ago. Here's Sterling Marlin picking up another position, and Sterling is just having a fantastic afternoon after that misfortune yesterday when he crashed. You know, he did the, exactly the same thing here in the spring. Qualified about eighth, blew a tire in practice, wiped the car out, had to go to back up, and had a top five finish. Having a very good run here today, and fellas. 
Rusty Wallace is gaining on Dale Earnhardt right now. Or at least he did for a few laps now. Earnhardt might have uh, picked back up a little bit. It looks like he's starting to stabilize because, yeah. again, we talk about what Rusty Wallace has to do. Richard Childress, his crew, they're no dummies. They know what they've got to do. Keep that 27 down two laps. If they do, they just might win this championship. Certainly of the three in contention for the Winston Cup, Dale Earnhardt is having the best day. Rusty is two laps down, and Mark Martin is one lap down to the field in the Atlanta Journal 500 with 100 laps completed. Why is Ford Ranger America's most popular compact truck? Well, the Ranger XLT has a 660 powertrain warranty and cast aluminum wheels. The Chevy doesn't. Ford Ranger has anti-lock rear brakes and electronic fuel injection. And Ranger has it all for less money than Chevy. You can bank on it. The toughest competition we have is ourselves. Save big on all Ford Ranger pickups during November Truck Month at your Ford dealer. Bud? Then where does she come from? Nineteen eighty one, a year of first time winners. Dover, Delaware, in May of eighty one, the first win for both car owner Junie Donlevy and driver Jody Ridley. In over five hundred races as a car owner, this remains as Don Levy's only victory. Morgan Shepard entered victory lane for the first time in his career that year at Martinsville. Despite this win in his rookie year, Ron Bouchard takes home Rookie of the Year honors in 81. Well, that was one of the very first races that uh, I did for ESPN as a broadcaster, that race that Morgan Shepard won back in 1981 at Martinsville. Driving a car owned by Cliff Stewart out of High Point, North Carolina. Let's go to uh, Dick Berger. You got a problem, Dick? We all have a problem right now, but Dick, <laughs> these are flies on my uniform. We have had an invasion of flies here. It's a little reminiscent of a Formula One race where earlier this year the flies attacked everybody wearing orange suits, but they're attacking every color. Look at them even on the top of my microphone. It's so bad down here right now. One of the crew members in Dick Trickle's pit is spraying himself with brake fluid, hoping that will repel him, and everybody's having a hard time concentrating. These things bite. I don't know what they are, but as the temperature has increased, Boy, they are out. It's a, it's not a pleasant place at the moment. We'll try to get you a can of raid, Dick, as soon as we possibly can. Well, there's Mark Martin. He's a lap down at 12th position right now. And Mark Martin's got some problems because he is drifting back. He was up. He's lost four or five spots. And look, we see Jeff Bodine go by. And behind him, Michael Walters pulling up alongside. So Mike, Mark Martin's got some serious problems in that throws like four. Now inside Mark Martin's car as we look ahead to Jeff Bodine. Now out the back of Jeff Bodine's car looking back at Mark. And we saw Michael Walter briefly in the country time Pontiac move up, trying to move outside Mark. Mark couldn't make the pass. Rusty Wallace is 33rd. Make that 27. Two laps down. Rusty Wallace is 27th. He must finish 18th or better to win the championship. Mark Martin is 14th, and Dale Earnhardt is the leader, and there are seven cars out of the race. So if the race ended right now, Dale Earnhardt would be the 1989 Winston Cup champion. Of course, the race is not going to end right now. Still over 320 laps to go. There I mean, is, 220 laps. There is Dale Earnhardt, the leader of the race, trying to keep Rusty behind him and keep him two laps down. So there is a lot that has happened here in the first 107 laps of this race. In fact, the, uh, the scenario has just completely changed around. More from Dick Bergman on championship pressure. 
Well, obviously, there's a lot of pressure on everybody here, not just for the million dollars, but it's very infrequent in anyone's life that they have an opportunity to win something as significant and important as the Winston Cup championship. But as we watch the teams this week in the garage area, the pressure seemed to be worse on Mark Martin and his crew than on anybody else for a couple of reasons. First, Dale and Rusty have both been here before. They know what it's like to be besieged by reporters, by fans, by sponsors, and just about everybody else. They, they know they can't go to restaurants. And the way they pretty much handle it, as Elliot goes behind the wall, the way Rusty and Dale handled it this week is they stayed as much as possible out of the public eye. They pretty much stayed in their trailers. Mark Martin and company, Mark Martin and company, on the other hand, really felt it. Uh, Steve Neal yesterday told me that it was the worst deal in his whole two years. He said people have really put a lot of pressure on us. First, they wanted if we could build a team, we did it. Then they wanted if we could build a pole, we did it. Then they wanted if we could win a race, we did it just a couple of weeks ago. Now they're calling up saying, hey, can you win the championship? Well, they're kind of calm today, but I can tell you that the pressure has really been on Mark Martin and his guys, and they're performing admirably. Bob Jenkins? All right, thank you very much. Well, let's go down to Jerry Punch, who is, uh, he's uh, running alongside the Bill Elliott car. Jerry, what is the situation with Bill? Well, they had a discussion here in the pits, and apparently Ernie Elliott felt the engine may have blown up inside. Bill wanted to make it sure they had every chance to get the car repairs. They sat on the pit road for a while, took the spark plugs out, changed the coil, changed some of the ignition parts, and apparently it hasn't rectified the problem. They are going to run back to the garage area and continue to work there, hoping that maybe there's something they can fix and get him out. He is currently fifth in the points, but only 71 points in front of Kenny Schrader, who stands in sixth spot. And while I have it, I want to update a little bit on Mark Martin. We were told a minute ago that apparently they overcompensated on the chassis. The car had been so loose, they tightened the car up so much, the car is pushing so bad, Mark just can't drive it. The car is just so slow in the corner, so they're going to have to wait, buy their time, and come in and make the chassis adjust. Thank you very much, Jerry. So we're riding with Mark Martin now as he is one lap down in 14. Rusty Wallace is in 27th position. And if the race were to end right now, Dale Earnhardt would be the 1989 Winston Cup champion. Stay with us. Being a part of the U.S. Armed Forces is an experience you can be proud of. There's a pride and peak performing, and the top was made for you. It's a peak, you won't stop short of the peak. Every time that green flag drops, or whenever the temperature does, I want the maximum going for me. That's why I've got peak on my car and in my car every time. It don't stop short of the peak. No, don't stop short of the peak. There's a rough road ahead with no end in sight. Quaker State is quality engineered to exceed every single American, European, and Japanese car maker's U.S. requirements for maximum engine protection. So pistons are protected from friction mile after mile. Valves are protected from wear year in, year out. That's why Quaker State engines run strong and run long. Quaker State engines don't know when to quit. The big Q stands for quality, always has, always will. The nation's top teams battle toward the season's first tournament championship in a Madison Square Garden showdown. It's the Dodge NIT semifinals, Wednesday night at 7 Eastern, live on ESPN. Here are the top 10 at the end of 116 of 328 laps in the Atlanta Journal 500. Dale Earnhardt, the leader, Ken Schrader second, followed by Dick Trickle, Sterling Marlin, and Jeff Bodine. Navy Allison, Lake Speed, Neil Bonnet, Ricky Rudd, and Kyle Petty are 6 through 10. This is the first time that a driver has come into a final Winston Cup race of the year in third position in the point standings with a shot at the title. That's since the current point system was adopted in 1975. And again, if the race were to end right now, Dale Earnhardt, who is leading the race, would win the Winston Cup. The other two that are eligible, Rusty Wallace has had bad luck so far today. He finds himself two laps down in 27th position. And then Mark Martin, the other 
driver eligible for the Winston Cup, who came into this race in second place in the point standings, is currently in 17th position, also one lap down. And Bob, you wonder if some sort of predator has been set here as far as championships are concerned in 1989. The Bush Grand National Championship, Tommy Houston was leading going into the last race of the season, and Rob Moroso came out the champion. A couple of weeks ago at Phoenix, Arizona, the Southwest Tour, we had uh, who was was leading the, the point standings, and then somebody else came out the, the champion. So maybe a precedent has been set here already this year. The ARCA championship was decided that way with one driver leading, right. and Bob Keselowski coming out the winner. Keselowski uh, beat Bob Bree back for the ARCA championship yesterday here at Atlanta. So there is Earnhardt lapping cars, passing Larry Pearson. Things just going his way so far in this race. Dale Earnhardt from Kannapolis, North Carolina, looking for his fourth Winston Cup championship. It looks so easy. Watch him drive the car through the corner. It looks so easy, like he's just going down after a loaf of bread. Richard Petty brings the STP Pontiac in once again. Remember, he was involved in an incident earlier in the race over in turn number two, lost the back bumper on the car. He sure would love to add another victory, his 201st before the 1980s end, but it isn't going to happen this afternoon for Richard. Changing all four tires on the SDP Pontiac, now going to work on the left side of the machine. In case anybody wonders, he says he will be back in that SDP Pontiac in 1990. Petty moves back out onto the racetrack. There's the damage there on the right rear of the race car. Boy, he had a deal down here last spring, didn't he? Remember when his car caught on fire and the pit driven would burn? It was a scary moment, that's for sure. Big fire what? with Richard Petty. And but you know, just think what's happened since then because there's all the crews now were pit fireproof uniforms, all the gas men wear the aprons, wear helmets. We see it each and every week, and, and most of it was primarily because of Richard Petty's accident last in, in March. And keeping drivers healthy in this volatile sport of auto racing is a concern of many. Here's Dr. Jerry Punch with a closer look at some of the safety companies. Race driver's worst nightmare is fire. Richard Petty's Pontiac suddenly backfires, igniting fuel spilling from the filler can. Gas man Robert Calicut is engulfed by a billowing inferno. His limbs and chest ablaze, he leaps across pit wall in search of aid. Firemen wrestle him down and extinguish a flame, but it's almost too late. This human torch suffered second and third degree burns over 25% of his body. Richmond, Virginia. Butch Miller spinning Chevrolet is rammed by Rick Wilson. The fuel cell explodes and fire again is unleashed. Neither Wilson nor Miller were burned, primarily due to the efforts of this man, Bill Simpson. Simpson developed and debuted his first fireproof uniforms in 1967 at the Indianapolis 500. Here Simpson shows confidence in this product as he allows himself to be soaked with fuel instead of blaze. He burned for 20 seconds without any evidence of injury. Today, many Winston Cup drivers now model Simpson's tried and tested garments, such as three-time NASCAR champion Dale Earnhardt and safety-conscious Darrell Waltrip, whose Nomex fireproof shoes match well with his tailored tied uniform. And then there's Bill Elliott, whose flaming red suit serves as fitting complement to his red hair. A few years ago, the Bell Race Star people, known for their expertise in developing safety helmets, began their production of similar flame retardant clothing. Their most well-known NASCAR clients are Kyle Petty and his father, the King, Richard Petty. NASCAR isn't the only place where fire safety is a major concern. In Formula One this year, fire at the German Grand Prix consumed the Lola Lamborghini of Philippe Alio. Fortunately for Alio, he was wearing protective gear made by the French-owned Stan 21 company. The three-layer Stan 21 suit seen here is a favorite of many Formula One and IndyCar drivers, such as current series champion Emerson Fittipaldi. At this year's Grand Prix of San Marino, unconscious Austrian driver Gerhard Berger sat amid the cockpit flames for 16 seconds before he could be reached by safety crews. His three-layered Stan 21 suit, rated for a 22-second burn, accomplished his task of protecting the driver. There's no doubt that incidents on the track and in the pits have made everyone in motorsports more aware of the dangers of fire. But the competitors can rest assured that the ongoing research by companies like Simpson, Bell, and Stan 21 will keep their worst nightmares just that, only a bad dream.
Well, Jerry, there was a bad dream as we see Richard Petty going around in front of Dale Jarrett out there right now. In 1964, a very serious fire in Charlotte, North Carolina, Fireball Roberts, a former winner here in Atlanta, was burned. I had the misfortune of being involved in the accident. My car burned up along with it. Back then, we were required to use a fireproof type of a uniform, not a uniform, but our clothing was dipped in a solution to flame proof them. And immediately after that, a number of companies went to work and developed the fire suit. And of course, there have been improvements made over the years. But Fireball Roberts eventually lost his life as a result of that fire at Charlotte in 1964. Well, in 1965, Ned, when I went to Daytona for the first time and they told me I had to soak my uniform, I didn't have a uniform or anything else. I went down and bought a white pair of coveralls complete with a loop for a hammer on the right side and dumped them and made them flame proof. Well, there's no question that safety improvements have come along through the years. You remember a long time ago when they wore leather helmets, didn't even wear protective helmets when they were in a race car. And, well, how about this guy? He doesn't have anything on the head except the number three. We'll be right back. If you love cars, you'll love Auto Week, the news weekly of motoring. Every week, Auto Week puts you inside the world's most exciting cars, GTs, sports sedans, collector cars, 4x4s, front drivers. Auto Week makes you an insider with industry news, personality profiles, old cars, columnists, the best classified anywhere. And nobody covers racing like Auto Week. You get the fastest coverage of Formula One, sports cars, stalkers, Indy cars. It's all in Auto Week, the news weekly of motoring every week. Now get a year's subscription to Auto Week. Call 1-800-554-3000 and get 52 issues at the basic price of just $23. Save 77% off the newsstand price. 1-800-554-3000. Operators are standing by. Call 1-800-554-3000 and let Auto Week put you in the driver's seat every week. The product, the vehicles, the testing grounds, the results. STP oil treatment is the edge. Back at Atlanta International Raceway, where Dale Earnhardt is just making a shambles of the Atlanta Journal 500. He passes Ricky Rudd, and that means that there are now only seven cars in the lead lap. Dale Earnhardt is well out in front of the Atlanta Journal 500. The 66 and 2 cars are in a battle for position. The 66 car right now driven by Rick Mast, and of course Ernie Irvin in number 2. This is the battle for 15th position. Now that 66 car of Travis Carter will be driven next year by Butch Miller. And they've announced that Banquet Foods will be the sponsor on a Chevrolet automobile. Got to be a great break for Butch Miller, who has performed so well in ASA and has driven in a few Winston Cup races. And his crew chief is going to come with him. Travis Carter is going to take the team manager, so his crew chief will be come with him. And there is Mark Martin in number six, who is in 17th position. One lap down. Let's move inside with Mark Martin. Now, remember we talked about the glare. Now, it's relatively cloudy here this afternoon, but let's find out how bad the glare is as we ride with Mark Martin. So far, so good. Not any glare at all going in turn three. Just a little bit of a dirty windshield. But this afternoon, if the clouds go away with that clean, that dirty windshield, it's going to be almost impossible to see. But it seems your eyes sort of adjust to that dirt as it builds up on the windshield. Vinny, I remember running dirt tracks back then and it get to where people after the race they had in the world, could you could you see anything through that windshield? And uh, you know, you were seeing all the time. I guess your eyes just adjust it to some degree. Ricky Rudd is in the pits. Bill Elliott has gone back out on the racetrack to update his fans. Rudd was just before Dale Earnhardt left him, was running in the lead lap, but now he is going at least another lap down. Bill Elliott, as we said, had gone back out, but he's running very slowly on the track again, apparently headed back into the pit area. Indeed he is. He's just entering pit road right now with a uh, very slow race car. Ricky Rudd pulls back out onto the racetrack. And here comes Elliott, not down pit road, but instead behind the wall. So 
What a difference a year makes for Bill Elliott, who last year at this time won the Winston Cup championship. He came into this race this year in fifth position in the points and has been having trouble all race long. Here's Rob Barroso and Derry Cope wheel to wheel off of corner number four. Your Bush Grand National Champion in number 20. Next year we'll have a full-time Winston Cup ride and the number 10 car of Derry Cope and they are battling for 20th spot. Derry Cope is sponsored by Pure Letter. They're hopeful that Pure Letter will come back next year as a sponsor on that Pontiac. And we don't see the sponsor on Rob Moroso's car but it's going to be Crown Patrol and Moroso slows and dips down to the pits coming in turn three. For Swisher Sweet, his sponsor on the Bush Grand National Circuit, sponsoring that car here with associate sponsorship from Prestone. Something Dick. happened to Dick Trickley, slow going in turn three. Oh, boy, he was our third place car, just having a fantastic race. And he also had a great race here in the spring. Well, the car faltered. It isn't nearly up to speed, but he stays out there. The car in, looks like it's running on seven cylinders because he knows that there's nothing they can do in the pits. He'll just stay on the racetrack and get the best he can. And by the way, yes, Dick Trickle was announced by yesterday. He is going to drive for Cale Yarborough in 1990, sponsored by Phillips 66, the petroleum pit. We oh. see uh, the backfire now, the exhaust pipe on the 84. Yeah, that car won't last long that way, then, when it starts backfiring when you accelerate. No, and the car number next year, Kill Yarbrough's car this year is 29, driven by Dale Jarrett, the hardest Pontiac. It will be number 66 next year in the Pontiac. I'm sure. Pontiacs. They will continue to race Pontiacs, yes. Now a lot of smoke coming from the Dick Trickle car as here comes Dale Earnhardt, whose GM Goodwin Chevrolet is running flawlessly, staying in front on the field with 139 laps in the book. Average speed of the race is 142.688 miles an hour. Earnhardt just simply driving away. Already has a full straightaway lead over the second place car, Ken Schrader. Oh, here comes Earnhardt, the leader in the pits. Wow, that was a sudden move off the banking in turn number four, and Earnhardt is headed toward his pits. Jerry Punch will report on this pit stop. This would be a scheduled pit stop for Dale Earnhardt. They've run a lot about 55 laps on field. It's exactly what they've done. The good race chairman like come to a halt. They will change right side tires. Leading at windshield. All important as you can see, they will make it another four tire change. Already losing the left side lug nuts. Now David Smith and Kurt Shelberty. Smith puts Jack to the left side of the car. Shelberty rolls the left front tire away. The new left front tire going on. David Smith has the left rear. Will in 21.4 seconds. He is down and away. And now the leader of the race. Ken Schrader goes was. by. He goes down in turn one. Earnhardt's trying to get up to speed as he comes off turn two. Here comes Schrader. It's going to be awfully close. There's Earnhardt. There's Schrader. Kenny's going to put him a lap down. Yep, they sure will, but I bet it don't take long if the green stays out. Chris Schrader has a pit stop coming up before long, but in about two laps, Dale Earnhardt will be back in the lead lap. Watch him. Boy, he's charging already. Davey Allison is in the pits. Davey was running in the fifth position. One of the car right side tires. He was one of those on the lead lap. Earnhardt already up on the back bumper of Schrader as exit turn two, just three quarters of a lap later. He looks inside Schrader, or does he? No, he's going to follow him another lap. Uh, yeah, he's going to follow him. Schrader gets in that turn. Schrader will go high, and Earnhardt will go under him, and right by Wow! Dale Earnhardt back on the lead lap. Here's our fourth-place car, driven by Lake Speed, coming in for a routine pit stop. Good run for Lake Speed in the Bullseye Barbecue Sauce Oldsmobile today. He's looking for sponsorship for next year, and hoping that he can continue his team. Four tires, the crew goes around, the jack's going under the car. Look, nuts are already off. These are routine pit stops they're making now during green flag conditions. Schrader will be coming in pretty soon. He's leading the race, but you can see Earnhardt has already put some distance between he and Schrader since he moved around. Of course, the newer tires helps to do that. I mentioned earlier that the tires they have here when they're brand new don't run quite as good, but most of them scuff those tires. So once they put them on there, they are ready to run and run hard. Schrader should be coming in this time. 
Alan Kowicki in the pits as Michael Waltrip goes back out of the pits in the Country Time Lemonade car. Ken Schrader's crew is ready for him. He's at the end of the back stretch. Now dropping low on the track in turns three and four. Getting off the accelerator and bringing the Bolger Chevrolet on to pit road. Now Rusty Wallace just went by Ken Schrader. If the caution flag were to come out right now, Rusty Wallace would get one of his laps down. That one of his laps back these down. Jerry Punch is in the, in the Schrader pit. Crew chief Richard Broom orchestrating the activities here in the Schrader pit, holding up two fingers like a general commanding his troops. Two tires only, he says. Two tires and we're gone. Left side rubber going on the Schrader machine. David Oliver, Richard Broom with his old Schrader's car. Whoa! Mark Martin comes in and Schrader Ooh. comes in a near miss as Martin brings his car in for his pit stop. Boy, the second close call of the afternoon on pit road for Mark Martin. And our crew cam on Robin Pemberton as they adjust the wedge on that car. Fuel going in. And away he goes. Mark Martin back out on the racetrack in competition. Sterling Marlin comes in for a pit stop. Sterling had taken over the lead in the Snoko Oldsmobile before he had to make this stop for right side tires. It looks like maybe they are only going to make right side tire change. And, and Rusty that? Wallace is coming in the pits. Jerry Punch is down in the pits. Jerry, call it for us. Rusty Wallace comes in as Sterling Marlin exits, and Rusty really jumps on the binder trying to slow that Pontiac down. Harold Elliott and the crew now will go to work on the right side of Rusty Wallace's car. Putting the jack beneath the car. Looks like it will be probably a two-tire change only. We are checking the left side tires. Looking at it very closely. Jimmy Maycar, the crew now having completed work on the right side. Second can of fuel in. Wallace's car is down and away. The strategy did not work. They changed two tires so they would not, they could hopefully save a lap against Earnhardt. It did not work because there goes Earnhardt by Rusty. Now two laps down. There was a near miss in the pits again for Mark Martin. Let's show it once again. Ken Schrader was pulling out as Mark was coming in. Schrader got to his service completed and hit it out of the pits. And we'll see Mark Martin diving in front of him. And boy, that was close. Huh, that was awfully close. But there's nothing you can do. You're trying to lead as fast as you can. You're trying to get there as fast as you can. Let's go down to Dick Bergeron, who's with Dick Trickle, who ran very well in the race for a while. Well, you really started well here in the spring with a third place finish. It looked like you're going to have another top five finish, but you're in the garage. What happened? Well, you know, we broke a valve or, or something went wrong on the top end of the motor. And, you know, it, it hurts the motor enough where they can't fix it. But we're, we're just proud to, you know, run good enough to stay up with these boys and, you know, uh, Hopefully we got a little season off here. We did run good. We didn't get a good finish, but you know, Jimmy had the car real close. We had a little bit left yet because we were a little bit tight, and we were going to lose it up as the day went along. Uh, I think it was the Bull Brothers, Bill Highlight Buick, you know, the AC Club, and Jerry Punch, Jerry, Kenny Schrader coming in for a pit stop. He just made a stop, Dick. Richard, Richard uh, you just made a pit stop left side tires, but now you have another problem. Well, we've got a vibration, and I don't know exactly what it is, but if it don't get any worse, we're going to leave him out. So you think you'll have to come back in, possibly an unscheduled there's a, stop? There's a possibility. I don't know. We're just riding it out to see what we got. Richard Broom, the crew chief for Kenny Schrader. They cannot believe the misfortune they have had today, and believe it, they're still on the lead left, running pretty well, but a serious vibration now on the left side of that car. Schrader playing with that vibration throughout the race. Dick Trickle, by the way, 48 years old, will undoubtedly be the 1989 Winston Cup Rookie of the Year. We'll be right back. the top five in the Atlanta Journal 500, the Winston Cup finale for 1989. Dale Earnhardt is the leader, Ken Schrader is second, Daryl Waltrip third, Jeff Bodine fourth, and Davey Allison fifth. If the race were to end right now, Dale Earnhardt would be the Winston Cup champion. Mark Martin is a lap down, and Rusty Wallace is two laps down. The number 17 car, driven by Daryl Waltrip, has not made a pit stop yet. He finds himself in third place. And he was a lap down before the others started making their green flag pit stops, but I think he's about to come in right now, Bob Jenkins, so he'll probably go down a lap again. We see Here he him comes. on the inside of the track. He is coming into the pits. So 
he was the last among those running on the lead lap to make a pit stop. Jerry Punch is stationed in Darrell Waltrip's pit. Darrell Waltrip is a three-time winner here at Atlanta Raceway, brings his tied Chevrolet on the pit road. The same car he won with them at Charlotte Motor Speedway earlier in the year. They are running here at Atlanta. The crew going to work on the right side. Seating what looks to be a very breezy, dirty windshield, scraping the dirt and the rail. Eddie Dickerson has the right front tire. Hammond watching the gas man. Now, Jeff Hammond puts the gas. A little over 12 seconds as, as he is now in the way. Good pit stop for Darrell Waltrip. Tied machine getting back up to speed. Boy, fuel mileage. You talked about getting some fuel mileage. All year, that car has been phenomenal. As a matter of fact, won the Daytona 500. Stock car racing's biggest event by getting more, better fuel mileage than any of the other competitors. That's how this 1989 Winston Cup season began back in February. It's been a tremendous year, and now we wrap it all up here this afternoon by crowning the 89 Winston Cup champion. It's still very much undecided. But again, if we were to end right now, Dale Earnhardt, who's the leader of the race, would be the Winston Cup champion for the fourth time in his career. And he's certainly driving in a championship manner here this afternoon. And Richard Childers and the rest of the Goodrich Cup team have certainly done their homework in setting that car up. They came here and tested a couple of weeks ago, did extensive testing, and came here very confident. They thought they would sit on the pole. They missed that by a little bit, but... They felt they were in great shape for the race, proving that they were. Hut Strickland in car number 57. Just passed by Dale Earnhardt. There he is, the Heinz Pontiac. And right behind him is Greg Sachs in the Dinnerbell Pontiac. He was involved in one of our early yellow caution periods. Car spinning over in turn number two, but there was no damage to the car or damage to the car and Greg Sachs is back at it. Here's the 66 car driven by Rick Mast. Best finish was in Daytona and this is the car that Butch Miller will be driving next year. Rick Wilson and his final run in this machine. Phil Parsons will be in this car in 1990. And we talk about how went the car number 10 just a moment ago being passed by Ken Schrader. The 25 car, Ken Schrader, is going to be sponsored by Kodiak next year because the Folger sponsorship is going on the Mark Martin in the 6 car. And 10, Derek Cope Automobile, sponsored by Pure Later this year. Again, hopes next year that Pure Later will be back. Car owned by Bob Whitney. And they're going to Chevrolet next year with that team going away from the Pontiac. And I'll tell you what, Derek has shown some real flashes of brilliance at time this year in the Winston Cup circuit. Rusty Wallace. Six wins in 1989. The points leader going into this race. He is in 20th position at the moment. He needs to finish 18th or better. Harry Gant has been off the pace all afternoon from the very drop of the green flag. He did win a race, though, earlier this year at Darlington. And Harry Gant has had some spectacular runs this fall in that skull bandit. But not today. He's made several pit stops. And as you said, really not up to speed at the beginning. Well, the next car we'll see will be Rob Moroso, the 1989 NASCAR Bush Grand National Champion, driving the Swisher Sweets Oldsmobile here today, but he'll be in the Crown Oldsmobile, 1990, running for Rick of the Year. And what a career he has ahead of him. Ricky Rudd in number 26. This is the final race in this car as he changes teams for 1990. He'll be driving the five car that is now driven by Jeff Bodine, sponsored by Levi Garrett. It will still be number five, but it will be sponsored by Kodiak, who is now Rusty Wallace's sponsor. Rusty Wallace's car, number 27, will have Miller Genuine Draft as a sponsor. You'll see the tied number 17 next year again, driven by Daryl Waltrip. Six wins this year. Great year for Daryl. Fourth in the point standings. The Kroger Pontiac, Ernie Irvin. The plans for this team and Ernie is still up in the air. There's a couple of people trying to put situations together that would involve Ernie Irvin, but we don't know what's going on. Well, the sponsorship goes away on this car for 1990. Dave Marcus will lose the Lifeboy sponsorship, but he'll be back. Yeah, he said he would be back. He says he only needs six hundred fifty to seven hundred thousand dollars to run the full circuit. You know, the others talk about millions of dollars. Dave said I'd do it for about six hundred fifty thousand dollars. He only has four full-time employees. Neil Bonnet currently running eighth here at uh, Atlanta. His best 89 finish was at Rockingham, a sixth. 
and he is going to be back next year in that car. Here's Alan Kowicki, the guy, the pole sitter today, who had an opportunity to pick up a bonus of $410,400. He is currently in about 10th spot a lap down, so he's going to have to get going if he's going to pick up the money. Here's Grant Adcox in car number 22, who also competed in the ARCA race yesterday. Had a good run yesterday until the car went away. And here's Kyle Petty in car number 42, all set for 1990. Finished fourth here in the race at Atlanta back in the spring, his best finish of the year. And he'll be back running the full circuit there next year. Three cars here, Michael Waltrip, who finished sixth at Dover in September. Right behind him, the number eight car of Bobby Hillen and Jeff Bodine right there also. Jeff Bodine, the driver of the yellow and white number five, is going to be driving for Junior Johnson next year in the Budweiser Ford number 11. Bobby Hill and the plans are still up in the air on that situation. The owners of that car, the Stavola brothers, Bill and Mickey, say they will be back next year, but no sponsor has been announced. There's Sterling Marlin in car number 94. In my opinion, aside from Dale Earnhardt, this guy has been the driver of the race so far. Yes, he has made a strong run from 40th place, now running in fourth place. Here's Mark Martin, and who was in second place in the Western Cup point standings. Rose Light Ford car, one win this year, 18 top 10 finishes. And as Benny mentioned, the uh, sponsorship of Pete Bolgers on this car in 1990. He's currently 14th, by the way. Here is Lake Speed in number 83. We talked about him earlier, looking for sponsorship, and he, too, will be back on the Winston Cup circuit. Here's uh, Dale Jarrett in the Hardest Pontiac, number 29, and again, his plans are up in the air for 1990. Nothing concrete except he is going to be sponsored by Nestle's on the Bush Grand National Circuit next year. And a great run on a couple of races this year, including a fifth-place finish at Martinsville. And Phoenix. And Phoenix. And here is Jim Sauter driving car number 44. This is the Bob Tullius machine. Finished ninth at Watkins Glen. And right behind him is the 15 car of Brett Bodine being passed by Jack Pennington. Brett Bodine is going to drive the 26 car, the Quaker State Buick, next year for Kenny Bernstein. And Jack Pennington, who hasn't run many races this year, his plan is still up in the air for 1990. But he's talking about running full circuit, running for Rick of the Year. Then we see Morgan Shepard coming into the picture in car number 75. He will be switching to that car right in front of him, the Motocraft Ford. That's the Raybach Valvoline car that he's driving this year. Which well, is going to be driven by Rick Wilson, and the sponsorship yeah. is up in the air on that car. And we're back to Dale Earnhardt, who's going to be right there in that same car. I hope you wrote all that down, because there's going to be a quiz later in the show. <laughs> a lot of changes being made for 1990, but you can bet it'll be another great year of Winston Cup competition. We're at Atlanta International Raceway for the final event of the year, and we'll be right back. Car picking up the leader. There's some debris on the backstretch. Rob Moroso spun and may have hit the wall coming off of corner number two. Here is Rob making his way to uh, the pit area. Yes, indeed, he made contact. There's some damage there on the uh, rear of the race car. It looks like all the tires are flat. Certainly the right side tires are flat, and there is a lot of damage to the right rear. Here's Here. a replay. Here's a replay as Moroso goes around, and he does make some contact with the left side of the car. I would dare say that he blew a right rear is what caused that problem to begin with because it looks like the tire came off and blew the right rear quarter panel away. And there were a lot of cars very close behind him, but everybody got through. And Dale Earnhardt had just put Davey Allison a lap down. Here he is in the pits. That's Rob Moroso. And uh, Davey raced Earnhardt back to the pits. But, I mean, back to the start-finish line, but couldn't get by. Here's Dale Earnhardt in the pits. Jerry Punch is there. We would expect a routine four-tire change for Earnhardt. Earnhardt and Childers were sort of chuckling a minute ago when the caution came out. They said, well, there's a 12-second lead blowing all the heck, you know. So, uh, but we'll just try to, try to do it once again. Let's go up and check with Kenny Schrader and Dick Bergman. Jerry, he's going to do the same thing as everybody else on pit road. He's going to take on four tires. A few cars have stayed on the racetrack, but all the leaders are in right now. Schrader's right side tires are down. Earnhardt, meanwhile, is already gone before Schrader even gets to the left side of the car. Shows you what kind of an advantage that Earnhardt had. Jerry's with Rusty Wallace. Jerry? They are putting the finishing touches on the four tires. Off for Wallace, his left side tire is now going on. Likewise, they are working on the Martin Martin car in front of the Rusty Wallace machine. Now left side tire is going on Mark Martin as he is hitting just behind the car of Jeff Bodine. Martin's car getting left side tire. Bodine is down the way. Kyle Petty close to the field now making their move down pit road. Well, another busy pit road here with a lot of stops being made. Bobby Hillen almost with a collision here in front of us as we watch Rusty Wallace catch up to the field on the backstretch. 
Well, there's a lot of difference between the uh, race cars that we see competing on Sunday afternoons in Winston Cup competition and those that you drive on the highway. More information on that, here's one of our ESPN Track Facts. Track Facts are brought to you by the Robert Bosch Corporation, makers of Bosch Platinum, the ultimate spark plug. Two weeks ago in Phoenix, Arizona, during the running of the Auto Works 500, two drivers fell out of the race with, quote, blood problems. But what happened to Ricky Rudd and Neil Bonnet was that the transmission got hung in fourth gear and they tried to slip the clutches. You can't do that in a Winston Cup car. Let me show you the difference in the clutches. This is the clutch they used to use in Winston Cup racing. See how big it is? This is the clutch they use today, seven inches across. There's no springs, no cushion at all. And the lining is a metallic lining. When they try to slip this clutch, it gets very hot and will not grip again. Therefore, when you slip the clutch because of a transmission problem, you end up with clutch problems. Back at Atlanta International Raceway, where we are under caution once again in the Atlanta Journal 500 for a spin involving Rob Moroso. 173 laps are completed, and we'll be back in just a moment. 1982, Darrell Waldrop wins the Winston Cup title. Darrell and the Dew Crew won 12 races in 82, including both at Talladega. En route to his second straight title, edging Bobby Allison by 72 points. We're reliving some of, the, some of the great races and moments from the 1980s here in the final race of the 1980s at Atlanta. If the race were to end right now, Rusty Wallace would be the Winston Cup champion. He has moved up to 17th, helped by attrition. Mark Martin, second in points, is 13th, and Dale Earnhardt is the leader of the race. Let's go to Jerry Punch quickly. Let's update the folks at home about Bill Elliott's situation. Dan, Dan Elliott, what's the problem? We broke a rocker arm stud and it's broke off down into the head and we can't get it out to repair it. We're running on eight cylinders, so we just took the rocker arms off those off that cylinder and we're running on seven. Seven cylinders for Bill Elliott in a long afternoon left here at Atlanta. All right, thank you, Jerry. Dale Earnhardt uh, will be the leader when we go back to green here. He has led 158 of the 175 laps and he has almost clinched the lap leader bonus. If he can lead eight more, he will have led the most laps regardless of what happens in the rest of the race. Here comes the field off the fourth corner and the green flag flies once again. We see Davy Allison alongside Dale Earnhardt trying to get by Earnhardt to get a lap back, but no one can ever pass Dale Earnhardt all day. It looks like Davy Allison about the same success everyone else has had. And Davey's running in fifth place. There are only four cars in the lead lap now. Earnhardt, the car number 25 against Schrader. Jeff Lodine, Carter, 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 Rusty Wallace is two laps down. Here comes Davey. Right here behind Ken Schrader. And Rusty Wallace up there trying to catch Earnhardt. Get by him and get a lap back. Is this wise, Ned? Well, yeah, I think he needs to get a lap back if he possibly can, even though he's in position right now to be the Winston Cup champion if the race should win, should end right now. But if he can do it and not take any unnecessary chances, okay, but if he passes Dale Earnhardt, he's going to have to take some chances. Ash, it looks like that Earnhardt might have pulled away from him a car length or two from the last lap, so I don't think we want to worry about Rusty Wallace going up and battling with Dale Earnhardt. No, I don't think so either. Earnhardt's car is just working so well. After two or three laps, he the tires, he just drives away from everybody. We saw him this way earlier in the year at Dover, Delaware, when he absolutely dominated the race up there, and he had the car set up with the same way here today, where he's complete domination. Ken Schrader in second position. Where's Mark Martin? Here he is, trying to spread his way through traffic once again. He's on the low side of Dave Marcus. This has not been one of Mark Martin's better weekends. He qualified for it back in 20th, and he just has never found a handle that you need to get around the racetrack like Dale Earnhardt's getting around the racetrack, like Ken Schrader's getting around the racetrack. Mark Martin just simply has not found it this weekend. And Ben, it was interesting. He came down here and tested, like Dale Earnhardt did, had the track with themselves, and just really set the thing on fire, was running some tremendous speeds, came here with a lot of confidence, figured they was going to blow the doors off of everybody. What happened? Track change? Temperature different now than the testing? 
I think that the track change, the temperature change, is probably one big reason that they lost the handle. But and again, I've asked them, Jack Rouse, Steve Mill, Mark Martin, they really don't have an idea exactly what happened. Yeah, he almost guaranteed people that he would be the pole sitter and win this race, but it hasn't gone well for Mark Martin so far today. He finds himself in 13th position at the moment. There's Alan Kowicki racing to the high side of Kyle Petty as they come off of corner number four. Alan Kowicki is a lap down in 12th position. And it looks as if the chances of him winning the Unicount money are pretty slim at this point. He's got to get the lap back. But I think one of the important things that we have to mention is this Unicount money is going to roll over until 1990. Boy, that will be exciting when we go to Daytona for the Daytona 500. Be worth $212,800 in Daytona. Boy, look at this. But at least the bonus that the folks here at the Atlanta Speedway won't roll over. So as you mentioned, it'll be 200 how many? Two hundred twelve. Twelve thousand eight hundred dollars. Oh, oh, oh Wicky sideways. Almost takes Derek Coke with him. Oh, oh man. And Mark Martin, I know he had to hold his <laughs> breath on that situation. Okay. That, that's right. Now here comes Bobby Hillen alongside Mark Martin, driving by him with ease. And Martin. Bobby Hillen goes by the 71 car, driven by Dave Marcus, who's trying to get by. Let's take a look at that again. Now watch this. I, you remember when I talked about the car going in the corner with a car on the outside of it? Look what happens when you don't have that air up there. The car just simply goes sideways. When there's another car there, it's very dangerous in Atlanta. Michael Walker didn't have any problems sticking the nose over out there, moving right around. Uh, the car number seven of Alan Kowick. Here's Dave Marcus slowing down in the lap boy Chevrolet. He was the 16th place car, and uh, he's coming in for a stop now. And again, all this attrition that we're seeing is playing into the hands of Rusty Wallace because every car that that uh, falls out of the race just makes it a little bit easier for Rusty Wallace to win the championship. He's taken the wide turn and is going to pull behind the wall. Dave Marcus. Well, you're exactly right. As long as Rusty Wallace can stay out there and the, and the cars keep falling out, the better his chances are of winning. He doesn't care if he finishes 10 laps down the field as long as he finishes 17th or better. You know, you said a moment ago that he finished, he is running 17th. If the race were to end, he would win. What would he win by, Kenny? Three points or something? He would win the championship by three points. Well, that's uh, closest, I guess, it's ever been. But you know, right now, Dale Earnhardt is not driving away from Rusty Wallace. In fact, Wallace might be gaining a little bit. Okay, now, Earnhardt might be playing with him a little bit. Don't know, but maybe Wallace has found a little speed or Earnhardt might have dropped off a little bit from what he was running earlier. Boy, there is so much at stake here this afternoon. There's a million dollars waiting the Winston Cup champion, plus all the prestige that goes with it. Dale Earnhardt, what would it mean to you to win the Winston Cup title? Well, we've won, uh, you know, three championships, and we've lost the... Uh, 88 and we ended up third behind Rustin Bill and uh, this year we've been so competitive and we led the championship and we to have it uh, taken away from us the way we've had it in the last three or four races is uh, been a little tough on us. It'd be great to come back and win it in a long shot. Uh, but uh, you know the guys just work really hard for it. But uh, you know everybody's worked hard and everybody wants to win that championship. Well, as Dale Earnhardt is telling us what it would mean for him to win the championship, we see Rusty Wallace pulling alongside and trying to get one of his two laps back, but now he falls in behind Dale. Ken Schrader is not too far behind those two cars. Ken running in second place. Of course, Rusty Wallace two laps down, trying to get in position to be just one lap down. Remember the last time we saw him racing this way at Rockingham? Boy, you just got to hold your breath here while these two are running together. You know it. Jerry, uh, you've been uh, down in Earnhardt's pit. Is he having a problem? Apparently a very minimal problem right now. Carl Richard Childers told me that Dale says this set of tires they put on the car has cut the car very, very loose. He cannot run the car on the bottom of the racetrack. Therefore, the primary area where he had everyone covered before was in the turns. And if you got them covered the turns in Atlanta, you got them covered because this track is one mile of turns and only a half a mile of straightaways. That's where Rusty Wallace is now making up some ground, trying to go by as he just did last lap. And he has successfully done so. And now Rusty Wallace is one lap down instead of two as he was able to pass Dale Earnhardt. 
our Napa race summary. Dale Earnhardt leads, has led 168 of the 185 laps. The average speed, 142.487. Six liters, 12 lead changes, four caution periods. A total of 18 laps, and four cars are on the lead lap. Those that have led a lap include Dale Earnhardt, Ken Schrader, Davey Allison, Dick Trickle, A.J. Foyt, Ricky Rudd. Those that are out of competition include Rodney Combs, Terry Labonte, Mickey Gibbs, Phil Parsons, Jimmy Spencer, Ken Reagan, A.J. Foyt, Dick Trickle, and Rob Moroso. And so Dale Earnhardt continues to lead the Atlanta Journal 500 with Ken Schrader at number 25 running in second spot. Back in a moment. there are no unimportant parts. If you own a computer, here's how to get the most out of it without buying lots of expensive software. Get ready to write down a phone number and watch this. CompuServe combines the power of your computer with the convenience of your telephone to bring you hundreds of online services, like a complete set of encyclopedias and the AP Newswire. It helps you decide on investments, bank, make airline reservations, and shop in the electronic mall. It connects you with other computer owners and offers games that pit you against opponents around the country. You get all this and more, and it's as simple as making a local phone call. To get online with CompuServe and over a half million people throughout North America, see your local computer store or call 1-800-522-4477 for a free informative brochure about CompuServe. Call now to get the most out of your computer. The final race of the year at Riverside. Bill Elliott in car number nine charges past our own Benny Parsons in turn number nine at Riverside to take the lead late in the race. Moments later, the rain which had threatened all day began to fall and the race ends under caution with Elliott taking his first Winston Cup victory after finishing second eight times. The Winston Cup title goes to Bobby Allison, his first and only championship. Another memorable moment and coming up at 4.30 Eastern time here on ESPN, World Cup Soccer, USA versus Trinidad and Tobago. So be sure to be with us for that at 4.30 this afternoon here on ESPN and then settle back tonight at 8 o'clock for some NFL action. The New York Jets against the Indianapolis Colts in the Hoosier Dome. That's at 8 o'clock tonight, Eastern Time, here on ESPN. Well, the leader is Dale Earnhardt in car number three. The 27 car of Rusty Wallace is ahead of Dale on the racetrack, but Rusty is one lap down in 16th position. And if the race were to end right now, Rusty Wallace would be the Winston Cup champion because he only has to finish 18th or better. We watched Rusty Wallace there we see it. Rut, Rusty Walsh running 16th. Mark Mark 10th, and Dale Earnhardt is leading the race. We saw Rusty Wallace blow by Earnhardt just a moment ago. Dale Earnhardt has changed his line around the racetrack. You see, he's running higher on the racetrack than he was before. He's getting a better grip up there, and he's coming back up on Rusty Wallace. Another piece of information there in the graphic we just showed you, 10 cars out of the race. Very important because the more cars that fall out, the easier it is for Rusty to win the title. Daryl Waltrip in car number 17 is one lap down, and his brother is just ahead of him in the yellow number 30 car. Michael is, uh, and Daryl are battling for seventh position. And here comes Alice Kowicki in car number seven. He's he also in this fight. Yeah, he wanted to get in on that brother actor, or sort of split him up a little bit there. He moves around Daryl, that was for position. As he moved around the tie Chevrolet. Sterling Marlin, the snow goals in field car number 94, is on the lead lap. He's the third place car. And there's Earnhardt and Wallace once again. And Earnhardt pulled back up on the back bumper. Rusty Wallace trying once again. 
to put in two laps down. Watch how high that Rusty Wallace, I mean, that Earnhardt is running. Let's get out to Dick Bergeron, who has some information on Rusty Wallace. Rusty Bob Jenkins, but a lot of the competitors here get worried around mile 300. Why? There's a mysterious engine ailment that has plagued many of the teams, including Rusty's team this year. And it's plagued Jeff Bodine's team. Bodine has lost four valves, all on number six cylinder, all exhaust, right about lap 300. Rusty's lost three of them. They've been split between number six and number eight. Now, nobody seems to know why this is happening. Some guys can avoid it, but some guys can't. The concern in Rusty Wallace camp obviously is Will it happen to us? They don't even want to talk about this valve situation. But there's only two suppliers of valves for the Winston Cup, so you don't have an awful lot of choice about what to do. But one of the guys that's got an interesting solution to the problem is Jack Roush, who builds Mark Martin's engine. He is designing his own valves. He is buying them in lots of 1,000. When they come with lots of, uh, lots of 1,000, he rejects about 800 of them, about 80% of the valves. And meanwhile, down on pit road, Jerry Punch is another story. Jerry? We are standing by in the Mark Martin pits, uh, Dick, and there may be a problem out there on Mark Martin's floor. Let's check in with Robin Pemberton. Uh, Robin, apparently you guys are watching the car very closely. What are you concerned about? Nothing right now. Uh, we're doing the best we can with what we got to work with. Uh, we got a little tire rub right now, but nothing to affect us. Uh, How did the right rear tire get pushed against the fender? I mean, what happened? I guess he got up against Jeff a little bit in the corner. Okay, they're watching the trouble down here. turn one and two. We have a car on fire after having hit the wall in turn number one. Brand 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 car at the bottom of the racetrack. Still a little bit of fire seen from underneath the car, but mostly smoke from the Grand Adcox car. This brings out our fourth caution period of the afternoon. Safety vehicles arriving on the scene. This is down in turn number between turns one and two. Now, Dale Earnhardt is racing Rusty Wallace back to the start-finish line. He wants to keep him that two laps down, so he's got to run hard. His crew has told him where the trouble is on the racetrack, so he does beat Rusty Wallace back to the start-finish line, keep Wallace two laps down. And both drivers get on the brakes to slow and go by the scene of the accident. We'll replay it and get just the tail end of Grant Adcock sliding down the banking after touching the wall. Well, he's not touched the wall. He's hit it awfully hard with the right front. And it appears as though he's knocked an oil line or something because there is some oil spewing on the exhaust system on the car. That's where the fire is coming from. That quick, quickly extinguishes when the car stops. So 203 laps are completed now, and the caution flag is back out at Atlanta International Raceway on this November afternoon in which we wrap up the 1989 Winston Cup season. We'll see them coming into the pits this time around and expect a four-tire change from the Dale Earnhardt crew. As you can see, they have the sign lifted very high for him so he'll know where his pits are. And that is important because he is pitted all the way down at the end of pit road to get that high sign way up high. He's able to pick it up right away and judge where he has to stop. Some other guys who do not have that, it's hard to judge where you're going to stop because all you see is a mass of humanity. All right, here comes Earnhardt and Jerry Punch is right there. Goodwin Chevrolet comes in and it will, as Dan indicated, it will make a four-tire change here down on the leader's car. Right front tire going on for Chevrolet and the crew. And Rusty Wallace also getting right side tires. And they are making a four-tire change on Wallace's car as well. Bodine is in and Mark Martin is in front of Rusty Wallace. Now the Jack putting the left side of the Wallace car. Left, left side tire going on the Earnhardt car. Left rear lugs going on. Let's go up to Dick Schrader, up to Dick Berger in the Kenny Schrader pit. Well, Jerry Schrader's crew has been a bit behind Earnhardt, who's going now, and they're just now getting the left rear tire. Schrader, who dropped the Another busy pit road as the drivers complete their work and move back out onto the racetrack. And Dale Earnhardt will assume command once again of the Atlanta Journal 500. We'll be back with more right after these messages. In 10th position, as we get set to go back to green, he is make that 7th position one lap down to the field. I would say that's a 30 car because he's been running with that 30 car most of the day. And Rusty Wallace is in 16th position, two laps down. But again, he only has to finish 18th or better 
to win the Winston Cup. Dale Earnhardt is doing all he can to win the Cup because he is leading the race and has led the most laps. Well, Benny Parsons has had his hat of the week for just about every race this year in Winston Cup competition. Here's the appropriate final installment. This afternoon about 5 o'clock, there's going to be a race car driver's dream come true. He's going to be presented a check for $1 million. But I guess the most important thing is Miss Winston, Sandy Fix, is going to present a trophy that says 1989 Winston Cup champion. Which one will it be? Bill Earnhardt? Mark Martin or Rusty Wallace. The fellow wins the championship, that will be the hat of the week. The other two guys, it will be a collector's item. And if you would like to uh, send us your hat of the week, we'll be back with it in 1990. Send it to Benny Parsons, 112 Main Street in Ellerby, North Carolina, zip code 28338. We'll be back after this. In the car. We see them with the jaws of life peeling the roof of the car back. They're going to they're trying to bend it. You see, they're beating. They're trying to bend the roof so they now there it's bending. Now they're finally able to where they can get down to Grant to extricate him straight up out of the race car. It's very difficult to get a race driver out of a stock car because of the fact that uh, there is a cover over his head, and so. This certainly is no indication of the seriousness of the accident. We have no word at the moment on the condition of Grant Edcox. But we are under caution, and we'll be back after this. Here in the Atlanta Journal 500, the leader is Dale Earnhardt. Ken Schrader is second, Sterling Marlin third, Jeff Bodine fourth, and Michael Waltrip is running fifth. There are four cars on the lead lap. Sixth is Davey Allison, seventh Michael Waltrip, Alan Kowicki, Darrell Waltrip, and Mark Martin, eighth, ninth, and tenth. 11 through 15, Ricky Rudd, Morgan Shepard, Lake Speed, Neil Bonnet, and Davey Allison. And then 16 through 20, Rusty Wallace, Ernie Urban, Derek Cope, Dale Jarrett, and Harry Gant. 16 through 20, by the way, all are two laps down. Grant Adcox has been removed from the uh, automobile. You can see he is being loaded into the ambulance at the moment, wearing a neck collar. But again, we don't have any information on uh, the seriousness of the crash, but we have seen many, many crashes in Winston Cup competition that appear to be very bad, and uh, the driver can walk away relatively unscathed. We hope that there has been no serious injury sustained by Grant Adcox in this accident up in turn number two. Now that the driver has been extracted from the car, it should be a relatively short period of time now before the car is moved off the track, and we can get back to green flag racing once again. We're deciding the Winston Cup champion here at Atlanta for King Richard Petty. It's the Firecracker 400 at Daytona in July. Richard battles with Cale Yarborough to the caution flag through the tri-oval. Petty wins by inches. It's his 200th career victory and joining the celebration is President Ronald Reagan. Later that year in Riverside, Terry Labonte wins the Winston Cup title for car owner Billy Hagan. Remembering some moments from the 1980s in Winston Cup competition. Grant Adcock's car on the back of the, of the truck, uh, severe damage to that car. There we see the right side. We can see just how hard did Grant hit that wall. You know, and my brother-in-law was explaining to me the other day, he was about how he fell out of the bleachers at a football game. <laughs> Uh, and it was about two stories up. And I said, you just described to me what it feels like to hit the wall in a race car running about 150 miles an hour. Yeah. It's something that uh, most of us will never experience, thank goodness. <laughs> all the air leaves your body. When you hit, all the air leaves your body. And honest, if you're okay, it takes about two minutes before you can really get a decent breath. You're <laughs> trying to breathe. Please, I hope, you know, that's one reason I quit, folks. <laughs> I didn't get used to I never got used to that feeling. Isn't it a lot safer and a lot more fun up here? Oh, it's a lot of fun. Thank you very much. <laughs> While we have the opportunity, let's just say a thanks to uh, all the people who have made our 1980 Winston Cup races uh, hopefully successful and enjoyable to you, the fans. 1980? Did I say 1980? 89. Well, 89. A lot of people from NASCAR, of course, help out uh, Dick Beatty and uh, 
Les Richter and Chip Williams and all the other NASCAR people that help out, not to mention Bill France Jr. and his family. And uh, all the racetracks that we go to are treated very well by the uh, racetrack personnel. We appreciate that. It makes our job just a little bit easier as we travel many, many miles during the course of a racing season. But it's all worth it when we can uh, bring you some good, close, exciting racing competition here on ESPN. Still under caution because of the Grant Adcox crash. Dale Earnhardt is the leader of the race. Mark Martin is shown in eighth position, and Rusty Wallace is 16. Back after these messages. 10 is Greg Sachs in the Die Guard Racing R&D car. With the same engine that Richard Petty had won with the year before, Greg pulls off the upset of the decade. At Darlington in September, dollar bills were falling for Awesome Bill. Elliott won a million dollars at the Southern 500 after earlier victories that year at Daytona and Talladega. Bill won 11 races in 1985, but Darrell Waltrip captured his third Winston Cup championship that year. Darrell Waltrip, the champion in 85. Who will it be in 89? We have yet to determine that, but the green flag has just come out. The car is moving through the second turn and down the back stretch. Lap number 214, so we've got 114 more laps to go. Dale Earnhardt is the leader. Grant Adcox has been removed from the car and taken to the infield care center. When we have word on this condition, we will pass it along. We do not have any word at the moment. That car going out of the pits is Brent Bodine, who has had a rough day here in the Bud Moore Motorcraft Ford. This is the last race he'll be driving that car. We're going to Kenny Bernstein, of course, as we mentioned earlier. Rusty Wallace is two laps down at number 27. The second place car is 25, Ken Schrader. The red car there, third in line. Despite that vibration problem that Schrader has experienced all day, she has, he has still uh, been very competitive. The number 66 car of Rick Mast showing a lot of smoke from the back of that car. And again, each one that falls out makes the chore of Rusty Wallace in winning this championship just a little bit easier. Mass brings the car off the track onto the apron. We do not see a caution flag at the moment. Car is moving slowly down the backstretch. The leaders go by, and NASCAR chooses not to throw the caution flag. I think you go down at the racing groove pretty quickly, so everything should be okay as far as the racing surface is concerned. Yes, that's right. Watch the action on the track. Bill Elliott comes in. And here is Daryl Waltrip slowing in the Tide Machine. What did Dick Bergman say about the mystery of the 300-mile mark? Oh, man, we've been 300 what? 25 miles, and all of a sudden, two cars in the last lap slowing dramatically. Rick Mass out of the race, and Daryl Waltrip looks like he could possibly be on the seventh floor. He was running ninth when this problem occurred and now is losing spots rapidly. There goes Richard Petty by on the outside. Yeah, that engine is definitely not performing up to its earlier way of doing it. Darrell Waltrip, fourth in the point standings coming into this race, has won six times in Winston Cup competition in 1989. Dick Bergeron, what's the problem down there? Well, it's something wrong with the carburetor. They're not entirely sure what it is right now, but if it's carburetor, at least that's something they can fix. So they do have a carburetor here in the pits. They're getting ready to put it on if they do decide to bring him in. But the car is just fluttering, bubbling. It's not running properly, and they think it's a fuel carburetor type problem. So the guy that won the Daytona 500 to start off the 89 season is in trouble here in Atlanta. But, Bob, I think his fourth position is pretty secure as far as the point standings are concerned. He had a 119-point lead over Bill Elliott coming into this race. And, of course, the problems that Bill Elliott has had here today has him many laps down. So I think Darrell's secure as far as that fourth place in the point standings is concerned. We're watching a great battle for position from Mark Martin's car. Just ahead is Alan Kowicki, also involved in this. Kyle Petty at number 42, the 30 car of Michael Walter. All four of these guys are battling for position. This is 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th.
you're right, Bob. This is a great race. Cars evenly matched, all running in about the same place on the racetrack. Mark Martin trying to look on the inside, and Kyle Petty putting a little bit of distance on his competitors. Kyle Petty had a tremendous run going today in that peak body. Yes, he has run very strong in that car. He is a lap down, got caught in that early green flag round of pit stops. He had made a pit stop when Dick Trickle had not, and that put him a lap down, but he has run with the leaders ever since. Kyle Petty is fifth, then Michael is sixth, Kowicki seventh. Here is the battle for second position involving Ken Schrader at number 25 and Sterling Marlin at number 94. Well, wouldn't that be something that Sterling Marlin could get up to second place after starting dead last? 42nd starter today. He qualified sixth, but as we said, he crashed his car in practice on Saturday morning, had to resort to a backup car in NASCAR rules. NASCAR rules, when you do that, you must go to the rear of the field. As we watched Kowicki trying to go inside the Michael Walker car. That's Kowicki in the 7 Xerox, Michael Walker in the yellow number 30 country time car. That's fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth positions that we're watching there now as Alan Kowicki tries to take over the sixth position from Michael Walker. Looks like he has it. Yes, indeed, he does. Now let's watch Mark Martin. But look at Michael Walker battle back on the outside. It's three abreast coming off the fourth turn. Mark Martin is on the inside, Kowicki in the middle, and then Michael Waltrip, Mark Martin backs out. Yeah, I think he decided that was not the smart thing to do, to stay down there three abreast and uh, let those guys race a little bit and try to pick a better time to move around. number six car and this is the view from inside this is what mark sees or can't see he can't see anything. he's got the car stopped though at the bottom of the racetrack in turn number two boy just a huge explosion from that number six car and there is mark martin climbing out we're glad to see that he's okay you just saw a few minutes ago how those fire suits can help save a driver's life. And now look at the flames around the number six car. Yeah, and it might even be inside right now. That car, that it's certainly in the driver area. Let's watch it again as he goes into turn one. Just as he backs off the gas, gasoline, that car explodes. The engine explodes. It breaks a connecting rod, a crankshaft, something like that. It breaks a hole in the oil pan. The oil comes out, gets on the exhaust system, and that's the flame that we see flames all over the engine. Oh. Now, there's probably not coming back inside on Mark Martin because of the floor pan and everything else, but he's, he knows there's fire there, and he stops as quickly as he can. He gets down to the grass, and that's the worst thing that happened to him because... Now, here it is again in real time, and you can see how fast he's going and how quickly things occur. And we see the flames will not come up because of the spoiler. Look at how the flames are right behind the spoiler. It won't let it go back up on the deck to get inside the car. And the leader, Dale Earnhardt, comes in for a pit stop. Jerry Punch is there on lap 226. Dale Earnhardt brings the Goodrich Chevrolet to a halt at the far end of pit row. The routine pit stop for the Goodrich crew, a four tire change, cleaning the windshield. Let's go up and check in Kenny Schrader's pit. Same strategy up here, Jerry. This, by the way, is the same car that Schrader won Charlotte with, so it's a very, very good car. Schrader just taking a quick drink with it. Jerry Punch. Left side rubber completing the pit stop for the Goodwin Chevrolet. The car stalls now. He gets it refired. Let's go back up to Nick Bergman. They're still working on it up here, Jerry. They're still trying to get the left side tires on. Finally, there goes Schrader out with a peel of rubber off the Schrader moves back out. Jeff Bodine pulls out just behind Ken. And we look at the inside of Mark Martin's car. The fire extinguisher has gone out, has gone off. You can see that uh, there's a, a lot of, uh, of that substance powder. in there. The powder that they, that they use in that. And Mark Martin now 
will uh, finish third in the 1989 Western Cup point standings. Yeah. He was only one point ahead of Dale Earnhardt coming into this race, and as a result of going out, regardless of what happens to Earnhardt from here on out, he will be finished third. The Winston Cup championship hopes are gone for Jack Roush, but still a smile from his face. He has nothing to be ashamed of because this team has made a great leap forward in 1989. But there you can see from our in-car camera the remains of the Stroll Light Ford. And, you know, uh, Dick Bergeron made a point earlier today about gear and RPMs, what Mark Martin had to do. And the RPMs, if they turned that Stroh's Light Ford today, like 8,500, that's a bunch of RPMs that did not take it today. Darrell Waltrip comes in for a pit stop. Let's go to Dick Bergeron. This is going to be a long pit stop because they're going to change the carburetor on this one. And just before Waltrip came in, Jeff Hammond summoned his team, much as a quarterback would summon his team before a major play. He got them in a circle all around him, and he told everybody what they're to do. And if you can see this, there's about six wrenches on this carburetor right now. There's four different guys, or five different men, working on it right now, trying to get this carburetor changed. One other man wiping the windshield. It's going to be a long pit stop for Darrell Waltrip. He's likely to go down the lap. Jerry Punch is with Jack Roush in the pit. Jerry? Well, Dick, the mood is a little more solemn here in the Stroh's Light pit. And, Jack, uh, you got to be proud of the, the effort the team put forth and your young driver, Mark Martin. You gave it, gave it a good hunt today. Yeah, Mark did a real good job. We uh, missed our setup a little bit on the um, qualifying uh, attempt on Friday and then thought we had the car right uh, yesterday in practice, but it didn't do quite what we needed for it uh, to do today. Looks like we broke our engine today. That'll be the first engine all year if that's happened. Uh, we're sorry we couldn't run all day, but we're real proud of our year. We've had a great year. Certainly enjoyed uh, Stroh's sponsorship the last two years and, uh, of course, uh, Ford with their good Thunderbird. But uh, we look forward to coming back next year, coming back real strong. Uh, we're going to test all winter, and uh, we're going to keep our engines running on the dynamometer. Whatever happened today, we'll try not to let that happen again. A two-year-old team for the first time in NASCAR history had a shot at winning the Winston Cup title. That team directed by Jack Roush, it has now gone up in smoke. Their year is over, but they'll be back, as Roush said. And it's only the fourth DNF that Mark Martin has had in 1989. So that's just an indication of how successful this team has been. Again, a replay. Watch the car erupt at the end of the straightaway. Boy, did it erupt. And, of course, we see the flames come out immediately from probably a broken oil line or something. Now let's watch it from the in-car camera and we'll listen also. And from there on, all you could see was a bunch of smoke in the cockpit and that's what Mark Martin had to deal with. Man. And, Bob, $105,000 difference in second and third in the Winston Cup point bonus at the end of the year and $50,000 difference in the Unical point money. So that was $155,000 yep. just in bonus money that we saw go out the window there. That was a very expensive uh, Darryl, incident. Look, Darrell Walter has changed his carburetor already and back on the racetrack. Let's go to Dick Bergeron, who has the carburetor. Yeah, here's the offending carburetor. Betty Parsons, you can kind of see what happens. You sort of push the throttle on this thing and watch it. You only got two of them that are opening up, and that's the problem. He was running on half the carburetor, not the whole thing. These are very complicated pieces of equipment. The wonder is not that one fails. The wonder is that they work all the time <laughs> as well as they do. You know, I was going to say, when you reported earlier, Dick, that it was a carburetor problem, I was going to say I think those guys are searching for another problem because carburetors are bulletproof. You never really truly hear that much of a carburetor problem, but this time you were exactly, Darrell Walter was exactly right. A carburetor only working on two instead of four barrels. Darrell moves back into the pit area, however, as Mark Martin's very badly burned Stroh's Light Ford car number six is on the back of a hook. We'll be back to Atlanta right after this. Moms in compact cars, like the hot little Dodge Shadow. Somehow, they aren't making them like they used to. Pronto, the fastest growing name in auto parts today. Pronto, featuring quality auto parts at lower prices. Cars aren't cheap. 
Never have been. That's why I never take shortcuts with cheap oil and air filters. Give me AC filters every time. AC filters match the original specs on my cars like a nut on a bolt. When you need to know about auto parts, ask the pro at Pronto. 1986, another year of first-time winners. Rusty Wallace captures his first at the Valleydale Meets 500 at Bristol, Tennessee. Bobby Hillen becomes the youngest winner in the modern NASCAR era with a victory at Talladega. Kyle Petty takes his first checkered at Richmond. Dale Earnhardt won his second Winston Cup championship. Grant Adcox is being airlifted to an Atlanta hospital. He has suffered injuries in a crash up in turn number two. He has been treated at the Enfield Medical Center, and now he is being airlifted to the hospital. We have no specific word on his injuries or his exact condition. All that we do know is that he is being airlifted from the racetrack to a hospital. Our hopes and our prayers are with Grant Adcox. And we saw the Bill Elliott truck sitting behind the helicopter there. And speaking of hospitals, their mother, Mildred, uh, Bill and Dan uh, and uh, Ernie Elliott's mother, Mildred, has been in the hospital. And certainly we want to wish her the best. And she is still in the hospital in Atlanta. Grant Adcox, 39 years old, from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Star in ARCA competition, especially on the super speedways. He has eight career wins on super speedways in ARCA competition. Here's the green flag, and the race resumes once again. And if the race were to end right now as we go back to green, Rusty Wallace would win the championship. He's still two laps down, but he is high enough in the standings to win the cup. Well, this is not from... two laps down now, Bob. He just moved around Dale Earnhardt. This is from Harry Gant's bumper camp. Herman moves right in on Harry's car. It's Bobby Hillen Jr. in the other Miller car. Quite a shot. And now Rusty Wallace had moved around Dale Earnhardt and is only one lap down, but Earnhardt has caught him back now. We'll see if he's able to pass Rusty and put him two laps down once again. Sterling Marlin was the leader on this restart. He didn't take Dale Earnhardt long at all to dispense of him and get him out of the way. Earnhardt now the leader of the, the number three, black number three, the leader of the race. 25, the red guard, Ken Schrader, is second. The 27, white 27, that's Rusty Wallace. As Bob Jenkins mentioned, if we could just finish the race in this position, would be the 1989 Winston Cup champion. Sterling Marlin is the fourth car in line and is third in the standings. So that's how close first, second, and third are running. And of course, Rusty is leading him down the back stretch. Now one lap down. There's Sterling Marlin up from last starting position. The other car on the lead lap besides these three, Jeff Bodine, he's fourth. And there he is behind Sterling Marlin, not too far. The yellow and white automobile, that's Jeff Bodine. That looks like Darrell Walter behind him. That's not. That's Derek Cope in the pure lead upon him. We're inside Jeff Bodine's car as he chases down Sterling Marlin. You can see he has the tinted windshield yep. on the right of his car and, and also the, at the upper part of the windshield. There's, there's a the big side. difference, even with as cloudy as it is, there's a big difference in visibility between the shaded side and the clear side. Yeah, they, they really didn't need it today, but they didn't know that when they started this race. And they knew how pressure it was. Look here the for the lead. Schrader oh, going by Dale Earnhardt. Ken Schrader takes over the lead from Dale Earnhardt. Here comes Dale battling back on the outside. Wheel-to-wheel -wheel competition. One of these guys going for the Winston Cup championship, while Ken Schrader, who came in sixth in points, 71 behind Bill Elliott. He 
might be able to pick that up today and move into the fifth position. Rusty Wallace is in 15th, so he has a three-position pad at the moment. There are 90 laps to go. Boy, you can bet that he would like to have a lot more than that because we still, as you indicated, have a lot of racing left this afternoon. Mark Martin, who came into this race as the third driver eligible for the Winston Cup, his hopes are over. He uh, exploded an engine and caught fire and dropped out of the race just a few laps ago. Dale Earnhardt's car is not nearly as dominant right now as it has been earlier on, as Ken Schrader once again tries to take the front spot away. Earnhardt has a problem, did. I don't think the car's handling as well in the turns, Ben, as it did earlier. See Schrader able to pull him coming up off of the turn, Earnhardt's car is not getting through the turns like it did earlier in the race. Just a great battle for the lead here between Schrader and Dale Earnhardt. First one will lead, then the other. Probably the set of tires he has on now are a little mismatched or something and not to handling quite as well. Now here are the cars that are out of the race. Very sig significant for the determination of the Winston Cup champion. Schrader trying awfully hard to get that lead away from Earnhardt just will not let go. Ken Earnhardt feels like that as soon as the tires get hot, that high groove that he's running will be able to come in. He could be able to lead the race, but he's waiting on the tires. Jerry punches down in the Earnhardt pitch. Does he have a problem, Jerry? What Childers is telling me, who's the car owner, Richard Childers, is saying is they're getting a lot of inconsistencies here. They put the same stagger on the car every single pit stop, but one pit stop... The car will be very tight. The next pit stop will be very, very loose. So apparently the temperature is fluctuating considerably here. It's probably dropped some 20 degrees since the race began. And certainly it's overcast, so that may have something to do with it. But uh, they really can't explain it. The car right now is indeed a little bit loose. He's trying to be very careful. He is keeping an eye on Rusty Wallace in front of him. Another eye on Kenny Schrader behind him. So he's got his hands full right now with a loose race car. But if anybody can drive a car under that condition, it's Dale Earnhardt. He, he can take a nil handling race car. Not that it's that ill, but it's not as good as it was earlier. And uh, do more with it than anyone I've seen. There we see Neil Bonnet on the inside of Morgan Shepard going down in turn one. There is Darrell Walter, the Tide Chevrolet, and Davey Allison behind those three automobiles. Well, that carburetor put Walter on the move again. It sure did. And there's Harry Kent, the Skull Bandit, coming up behind. Oh, you're in our scoring by Rusty Wallace, trying to put him two laps down. that uh, Rusty would have put up a bigger fight had this been uh, anything but the championship deciding race. Yeah, you're probably right. He, he didn't fight it that much, although his car is not uh, working as well as we have seen that Kodiak, Pontiac. You know, some Barry Dodson, Barry Dodson is exactly right. When he said that, his, that they was going to run this race with calculated aggression, you know, I think that's exactly why they run the race today. They have run hard, but yet not taking that chance that they normally would take. Well, Mark Martin will have to wait until 1990 for a Winston Cup championship. Dick Bergren is with him. Well, the most important thing is he's standing here at the garage area. He's able to manage a smile, and you don't seem injured in any way. No. 1990 is going to be a great year. This one's finally over with. What caused the problem? Uh, we broke the engine. We really, really ran the thing hard today, and, uh, you know, we were trying to... We, we went into this thing feeling like we didn't have anything to lose and we could only gain and we may as well, you know, we weren't counting points anymore. You know, we had to go into this thing and try to win it and see where the points fell. If we, you know, if we dropped out, that was an okay risk because we would still wind up third and that's where we're at. Roll the dice. Yeah, that's what we did, you know. The guys, uh, you know, they've really put a great effort into this thing and, you know, I want to thank Stroh's Light Ford Motor Company and Roush. The whole team, they put, put their heart into this thing this year. And so has this driver who right now is surrounded by well-wishers in the garage area. All right, our best to Mark Martin in 1990. While we watch this race here for first between Dale Earnhardt and Ken Schrader, Mark mentioned something I want to follow up on. He said, I'm glad this season is over. Both of you guys can speak to uh, completing the whole season, going down to the last race and being eligible for the championship. It's got to be a big relief when the year finally ends. Well, it's an unbelievable relief. Uh, as You know, in the job that I'm in right now doing TV, I hate to see the season end. 
I'd love to go to a race next week and do it in the week after that. But these fellas, Mark Martin, Dale Earnhardt, Ken Schrader, all the crews, they need a break because they've been going after it since February the 1st as hard as they can go. They really, truly need a break. They need some Saturdays and Sundays off to be able to stay home, watch TV, watch a football game, watch some auto racing on ESPN. And Earnhardt's going hunting tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we need a commercial break, and that's what we're going to do right now as we continue our live coverage of the Atlanta Journal 500, the final race of the 1989 Winston Cup season. Horrifying crash at Talladega. Bobby Allison cut a tire in the tri-oval near the start-finish line. This accident could have changed the sport of auto racing as we know it had the car gone into the grandstand. Fortunately, the safety cables did their job. Son Davey Allison shook off the thoughts of his father's crash and won that race his first Winston Cup victory. Dale Earnhardt repeated as Winston Cup champion. Remembering 1987 in Winston Cup competition and Dale Earnhardt is the leader of this Atlanta Journal 500. He is hoping that he can still pull out the championship here this afternoon, but if the race were to end right now, Rusty Wallace would be the champion because Rusty is running in 15th position and he only needs to finish 18th or better, regardless of what Dale Earnhardt does to win the Winston Cup. Here we see Jack Bennington, that lead car, the red and white car is Derek Cope. The blue number 47 is Jack Bennington, the gold and white car on the outside, Bobby Hillen, and here's Darrell Walter, the orange and white car on the inside. Helen is running seventh and Daryl Walter is eighth. I'm sorry, that's Kyle Petty in the 42 car and not Jack Pennington. Kyle Petty in the peak car being passed by Daryl Walter. So Kyle Petty obviously has some problems. He has been one of the fastest cars all day. Ricky Rudd is slowly coming off a of turn two and headed down the back stretch. The Quaker State Buick is definitely off the pace. Ricky running in the one lap down in 12th position at the moment. There's Ernie Irvin in the Kroger Pontiac pulling up on the back bumper of Kyle Petty. Ernie currently running in the 17th position. He's two laps down. And here comes Ricky Rudd into the pits. Ricky, as Ned said, was running in 12th position, but comes in for a stop. It's a little too early for routine stops, isn't it, guys? Oh, yes, it's much too early. Evidently, he had a right side tire going down and had to make a pit stop. This is for position as Darrell Walker moves around to Bobby Hillen. This is for sixth position. Bobby Hillen in number eight and Darrell Walter in number 17. And Darrell Walter's car running extremely good after the change in the carburetor. Yeah, that carburetor might be better than the one he had on it. Yeah. He said, why did we start with this carburetor? But he didn't lose a lap during that. He was one lap down already, and uh, they changed that during a caution period, kept him only one lap down, and they say, running very strong now. Bobby Hill, and even though he was black flagged twice, once for jumping the flag on a restart, and then uh, another time for, well, in fact, the same time, he went out of the pits for that penalty. He got above the white line. They brought him back in, but he is only one lap down, so he is having a very good run here today. He finished 30th in March, and his best run of the year was at Watkins Glen, where he came home in fifth spot. There is Kyle Petty running in sixth position until just a few laps ago he's dropped back a couple yeah he as Benny said he had been one of the fastest cars on the racetrack apparently the set of tires he has on now is not matched quite as good as some he had earlier but he's still running good but not quite as fast as he was his best finish of the year was here in Atlanta in March he finished fourth the 21 and 75 cars are also battling for position this is Neil Bonnet in number 21 and Morgan Shepard in number 75. Shepard, a high line through the fourth corner. Boy, he is up on the top side of the racetrack trying to get that green racetrack kind of a good fight. This is for ninth position. Harry Gant is right behind him, but Harry is two laps down. These two drivers, Morgan Shepard and Neil Bonnet, are only one lap down each. 
Gary currently shown in 19th position. There is Neil Bonnet, who is in 9th. Morgan Shepard is in 10th. Good battle between these two drivers. Morgan Shepard still up on the top side of the racetrack. There we see Dale Earnhardt, our leader, as he has been most of the afternoon. Boy, you can say that again. He has just dominated this race. And that word is overused. Oh, here's Daryl Waltra passing his brother Michael and taking over fifth spot. Well, well Michael said mom's going to be mad about this. <laughs> well, Daryl really has come up to the field. He was at the back of the pack as far as those that are one lap down. And they're the drivers from fifth through 13th are one lap down. And Daryl was back in 13th position. And he has come through all of those cars, passed every one of them, now running in fifth position. Daryl fifth, Michael sixth, seventh is Hillen. And look at this. Here's a battle for position. This is the third place tussle between Sterling Marlin in 94 and Jeff Bodine in number five. Bodine has caught Sterling Marlin, tried to pull alongside up one in turn three, did get alongside, but on the bottom of the racetrack, not able to get off the corner as well as Sterling Marlin is up on the top side of the racetrack. Earnhardt lead, Schrader second, then this battle for third. We're inside Jeff Bodine's car. Jeff Bodine, the winner at North Wilkesboro not too long ago, finished 19th here in Atlanta in the spring. and he is running the Alka-Seltzer sponsorship that we normally see on Jimmy Bean's car. Now, Jimmy did not make the field here in his own car, and so he got Richie Bickle to carry that on the side of his car, and he's doing a good job out there today. Of course, Jimmy Bean's will have the Alka-Seltzer sponsorship for 1990. He was very disappointed. There is the 0-2 car that we see. It's a Buick, one of the former Haas Ellington cars, carrying the Alka-Seltzer colors here today. And Bickle, one of those guys who moves up to Winston Cup competition from uh, some of the shorter race tracks. He's run some all pro races and now sets his sights on the Winston Cup series for 1990. Rich Bickle. Dale Earnhardt continues to lead with 266 laps completed. Rusty Wallace is right there, two laps down in 15th spot, and Daryl Walter in car number 17 has moved to fifth spot. You're watching live action from Atlanta International Raceway in the Atlanta Journal 500. We'll have more right after these messages. Carolator, exceptional protection for exceptional vehicles like yours. 1988 Atlanta International Raceway, Barry Dotson, Rusty Wallace's crew chief, is trying to bring Rusty his first Winston Cup championship. But Bill Elliott's crew knows they have the upper hand, a 79-point lead. Rusty has the pole as the field takes the green flag for the final race of the year. Rusty must win this race and hope Elliott finishes lower than 18th to win his first Winston Cup title. Elliott has started from 29th and is having a conservative drive. He did what he had to do. Pit crews gave their drivers good stops. Elliott never led a lap in the contest. Rusty, on the other hand, led the most laps and went on to win the race, finishing ahead of Davey Allison, Mike Alexander, Ricky Rudd, and Darrell Waltrip. Elliott came home 11th, and that was good enough for the title. Rusty did all he could, but wound up 24 points short. Bill Elliott won his first Winston Cup championship, putting his name in the stock car racing record books. 
A reminder at 4.30, the New York Jets against the Indianapolis Colts as ESPN's NFL coverage resumes Eastern Time, 8 o'clock tonight here on ESPN. Well, Davey Allison is headed for Pitt Road, and this is certainly not a scheduled pit stop. No, he was he slowed down coming off of turn two to a very slow pace. He is going to his pits, though, but he has coasted all around the racetrack, and I don't think he's out of gas. He was shown in 14th position for coming in, so again, this helps Rusty Wallace if he should drop out of competition. They're changing rubber on the left side of that car. But there's some smoke coming out from underneath the left side of the car. They had had some problems earlier. During the caution flag, they had had a string out checking the toe in on the car to be sure that the wheels were in alignment and everything. And they sent him on back out. Dale Jarrett going out after having made a pit stop. That was a regular pit stop for Jarrett. But uh, there must have been something wrong with the suspension there on the left front. So we see Davey Allison still in the pitch. You know, we've been talking all afternoon about money. The Winston Cup worth a million dollars. The Unical money worth $410,000. But there's other money that's going to be passed out at the NASCAR banquet in a couple of weeks from other products right Jerry indeed you are right Bob in fact there are 36 different accessory and contingency companies that will scatter some 1.8 million dollars you're taking a look at some of them the STP filters here the Simpson race products uh, the fine folks from Gillette right guard you see down here the S champion spark plugs along with Sears who sponsored the rookie of the year goodies headache tablets what we always use at ESPN of course and the Van Camps award the Van Camps determination award for the driver who has the highest finish and yet to win the Heinz Ketchup Awards here for the driver who has the best improved position. The Gatorade Circle of Champions. And of course, the Bush Beer Award for the driver who wins the most polls. $1.8 million being settled today among these 36 different accessory and contingency companies. Bob? All right, and speaking of STP, the STP Pontiac is in the pits. The hood that comes back down on the car. Richard Petty has won more races than any other active driver here at Atlanta International Raceway 6. He had problems in the early going this afternoon, however, and it appears as if they're pushing the car behind the wall. You talk about someone wanting the season to be over. We, Mark Martin made that mention a moment ago. Here's a guy, Richard Petty, I'm glad, I'm sure is glad to see 1989 come to close. Been a tough season for him, no doubt about it, but he's looking forward to 1990. Michael Walter just came out of the pits a moment ago, the Country Time Lemonade Pontiac. That was the second time that he had been in the pits in the last five or six laps. He had changed right side tires earlier, then came in, changed left side tires. He must have had a vibration or something, but he should be set to go the rest of the way. But Michael had been running as high as fifth position before these pit stops. Wallace and Derek Cope side by side, and we think that might be yes, the position. It is for 15th position, as a matter of fact, and Derek Cope passes Rusty Wallace, so Rusty now goes back to 16th, and he is right on the edge of what he needs to win the championship. But Davey Allison has dropped out since your run down right. there, Bob, so Rusty would still be in 15th. That will move Derek Cope into the 14th position, and Michael Waltrip, as a result of his two pit stops, also are, is probably behind those two drivers now. We don't have any specific information, but updating you on the situation regarding Grant Adcox, who was involved in a crash here earlier in the race. He was airlifted to Atlanta Baptist Hospital, and the only word we have from the NASCAR officials is that his condition is great. We hope that uh, everything goes well with Grant Adcox, but right now NASCAR says his condition is great as he's uh, on his way to Atlanta Baptist Hospital. Dale Earnhardt with one more pit stop to make. Should this race go green the rest of the way, he can. Here's uh, Rusty Wallace coming in the pits. Indeed, Rusty Wallace comes in for a stop on lap 279. Jerry Punch will call this stop. Here he comes, Jerry. This should be his final pit stop for the day. Earnhardt scheduled to come in in about three laps, but right now it's all Kodiak Pontiac on pit road. Drew, for the final time today, and probably for the final time it will be for the year. And they take the right side tires off. Jimmy Maycar. Barry Dotson and the crew now working on the right side of the car. John Dotson, he is down. The car has been fueled, and he is away. The Kodiak Kodiak heads for turn one. Why and does Norman fall every time? Oh boy, I'll tell you, he stays with he stays with the car as long as he possibly can, and uh, it got him in a little bit of trouble that time. We've seen it happen before that Norman Koshimishi uh, slipped and fell. And here's a good battle. Yes, it is. Jeff Bodine and Sterling Marlin are going at it for third position. Talk about equally matched cars. These guys have been running together for many, many laps. Arlen has 
been successful in holding off Jeff's challenge for most of the afternoon. As we go inside Jeff's car once again. Dale Earnhardt is pitting. The leader is on pit road for the final time. Well, will he change four tires or will he change two? Jerry Punch, he's coming towards you. I would guess they would go with two tires, and they are working on the right side of the car, the three-time. What's the cup champion? Waves off that Gatorade cup, and I don't want it. I got this to take care of. Right side tires going on. They just look at the left side tires, clean the windshield, and chocolate fires getting that second can of fuel all important. He is down and away. 13.4 seconds, he's back to turn one. That means Ken Schrader takes over the lead of the Atlanta Journal 500. There he is, but he'll be needing a pit stop shortly. It won't be this time around. You know, the similarities between this year and last year are uncanny. Here, Dale Earnhardt is doing everything he possibly can to win the race. He's dominated it so far. But if things continue to go the way they have, Rusty Wallace will finish within the top 18, and he will win the Winston Cup. But again, we've got many, many more laps to go. Schrader continues to be the late of the race. He's passing the guy that was in the catbird seat last year, Bill Elliott, and winning the Winston Cup. Going around Richie Bickle, who's carried that out for some sponsorship there. Richie has stayed in there all day. Pretty good run. Kyle Petty is in the pits in the peak antifreeze Pontiac going out. Michael Walter is back in with the hood up on his car, so Michael having some tough luck here late in the race. Now we see Sterling Marlin put a little bit of racetrack between himself and the fourth place car of Jeff Bodine. These will be the next cars going in the pits in just a moment. Ken Schrader, our leader, has not made a pit stop either. We know that none of these cars will be able to go to the end of the race without making a pit stop. But they say Schrader could go a little while before he comes in. Jeff Bodine about to come into the pits now in the Levi Garrett Chevrolet. And let's go to Jerry Punch. They are waiting for him to make his entry on the pit road, and we are told they are going to bring Rusty Wallace back in because they have some loose lug nuts. But Jeff Bodine, the order of the day here in the pits. Bodine, Levi Garrett Chevrolet getting right side tires, and Rusty Wallace also making an entry down pit road. Could be a costly miscue here late in the race. They are going to work now on the left side of the car. The overshot a little bit as Bodine exits pit road. They will change left side tires. May car being rolled that tire by Harold Elliott. Left front tire going on. John Dotson has the left rear. Barry Dotson watching every single lug nut. Wallace screams the car back in gear and heads for turn one. Boy, that time Norman stayed on his feet. <laughs> Norman, I'm proud of you, buddy. And this was an unscheduled pit stop for Rusty Wallace yeah. because he had just been in, and uh, he now goes four laps down. Oh, wow. This thing is not over yet, ladies and gentlemen. Don't leave us here because we've only got about 50 more laps to go, less than 50 laps to go, and the Winston Cup championship has not been determined by any means. So now when the other leaders make pit stops, when Ken Schrader... Uh, Jeff Bodine has already made one. When Schrader makes a pit stop and Sterling Marlin, Wallace might not be three laps down, but let's update the man to the fact that when Dale Earnhardt made his pit stop, he stayed in the lead lap. Jeff Bodine is a lap down to Ken Schrader right now. Here's the leader, Ken Schrader, putting a lap on Dale Jarrett. He'll be in for a pit stop soon, but for the moment, it's Ken Schrader in command of the Atlanta Journal 500. That's the end of the pit stops for today. Well, that puts Dale Earnhardt back in the lead and with a big lead as well. He's going to be well over a half a lap ahead of whoever comes out in second place. It'll either be Ken Schrader or Sterling Harlan. While we watch Dale Earnhardt, Michael Waltrip, who was running in the top ten, has gone behind the wall. So add another to the list of those who have dropped out. Rusty Wallace. There he is on the racetrack. We're checking to see exactly his position. 21st is what we have officially. Now, here's a smoking. Our Alan position, position uh, yeah. winner Alan Kowicki yeah. was smoking going in turn three. He has been running slow for a couple of laps. He hasn't made a pit stop and hasn't gotten back up to speed yet. Maybe now he, he will get back up to speed, but he coasted into the pit. Okay, let's go down to Jerry Punch. Jerry, that second pit stop that Rusty made, what was the problem? Well, that pit stop, as you said, cost him six spots from 15th to 21st and may cost him a million dollars. Let me show you what happened. They, he possibly said, I think I have loose lug nuts on the left side. Well, you remember when they came in the pit stop for fire, they didn't change left side tire. So this tire had been on and wheel had been on for quite a while. 
Apparently the lug nuts may have worked loose with all the torque in the corner. You see the studs were actually galling out the inside here of the wheel. This wheel was beginning to wobble and vibrate on the car. It was probably just before coming off. They came in wisely, took the, this wheel off, put a new tire on. But the concern now, fellas, is how about the studs that were being twisted and torn here by the torque of this wheel in the corners? Will those studs hold these final few laps? Boy, there is sure a lot of questions to be asked and answered here in the final few laps of this race. That and could be a problem. It could be a problem, but he's, his heart almost stopped that last time because Bobby Hillen went down in turn three, lost the car a little bit right in front of Rusty Wallace, and while he was getting the car back in shape, Rusty went by. But I know Rusty had to say, Whoop. Boy. Let's present this scenario. If Dale Earnhardt wins the race and Rusty finishes 19th, there would be a tie in points. Who would win the Winston Cup? Rusty would because he has the most wins. So he needs to finish 18th or better to win the title. If he finishes 19th and Dale wins the race, he still wins the Winston Cup, but he is running 21st at the moment. Now here's this incident you speak of, spoke of. Watch Bobby Hillen on the inside of Derrick Cope. They almost get together, and Hillen almost lost control. Rusty can't stand to see anything like that. Running out there in pretty good shape right now by himself. With uh, Derrick Cope behind him. There are only five cars on the lead lap. And our leader is Dale Earnhardt by a wide, wide margin. And once again, the reason there are five cars as opposed to four that we had earlier is the fact that Darrell Waltrip hasn't made a pit stop, green flag pit stop. He is in third position at the moment, but he'll have a pit stop coming up before too long. So the drama continues here at Atlanta International Raceway. We still don't know who's gonna win the Winston Cup. Stay with us. Here is the story. Rusty Wallace is running 19th now. Mark Mark is out of the race and out of the Winston Cup championship battle. Dale Earnhardt is the leader of the race. If it were to end right now, the season would end in a tie for points, but Rusty Wallace would win the championship because he has more wins. Well, there that, is Rusty. That's only fitting. As crazy as this season, <laughs> oh, a, a man. tie would be perfect. Well, it? You know, we came in here this afternoon, and it, it appeared to be a pretty easy task for... Uh, for Rusty Wallace. All he had to do was finish 18th or better, but it's been a terrific struggle for this man this afternoon while Dale Earnhardt has dominated the race. Let's go to Jerry Punch, who's with Barry Dotson. Well, actually, they are frantic here in the Kodiak pit. Barry Dotson and Raymond Beadle here talking to Rusty, trying to find out. Barry, from what we are told, you are running 19th, and if you stay there, it will come down to a dead even tie between you and Earnhardt, but you guys would win it by virtue of having more career victories. Do you feel like Rusty can move up and win it outright? He asked me who we're racing. I said, everybody out there, just pass them, but be careful. Uh, we'll take it any way we get it. I'll tell you, somebody's trying to make it awfully hard on us. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, they have come back. They have fought back from last down and now tire trouble and a near disaster a couple of times on pit road. And they are trying their darndest to get a rundown from his score to find out who is running in 18th, 17th, and 16th. So Rusty can go after whoever he can catch these final few laps. Well, I wonder why they really want to know who's running ahead of them. I mean, uh, sure, you got to pass every car on the track, but uh, there's Dale Earnhardt. And Dick Bergren is with the owner of the car, Richard Childress. Dick? Well, I bet your strategy is going to be pretty simple until the end of the race, but why don't you tell us what it'll be? Well, we're just going to keep going just as hard as we can right now. That's what we plan to do when we started the race. That's what he's doing right now. Very simple for you guys. No calculations, no math. Just stay out there. Now, we don't even know where the deal is. We're just going as hard as we can. That's the story. They're going to go as hard as they can. And this day, they have gone very, very hard indeed. Well, it's interesting that he said they didn't know where the deal is. And what he meant was how they stood as far as the points are concerned. Again, they're, they're doing everything that they have to do. They're, they're winning the race. And what else can they ask for except for bad luck on the part of Rusty Wallace? By the way, Bob, we talked about the hat, and next year, I know you want to send me one, but if you want to send me a hat, you've got to have to figure out a racetrack that it fits, and they kind of make a hat. Don't go buy one and send me a $3 hat. I probably won't get it on, you know? Spend the winter coming up with something creative, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, the winter, is, the winter is ahead of us, but we first have to establish a winner of this race and the Winston Cup, and we have got 
now less than just about 20 laps to go before the end of this race. We'll be right back. Atlanta Journal 500 from Atlanta International Raceway and the determination of the 1989 Winston Cup champion. Dale Earnhardt leads the race after 311 laps and Rusty Wallace is now shown in 15th position. He just passed Dale Jarrett on the track, moving him to 15th. Mark Martin is already out of the race. Rusty Wallace will win the Winston Cup or would win the Winston Cup if the race ended right now. And this is how Rusty picked up another position from Dale Jarrett. Just moved up on him, moved around the outside of the Hardy's Pontiac. And everyone out there right now realizes there is a championship at stake. No one is going to take a chance on blocking Rusty Wallace or Dale Earnhardt. Both these guys basically have clean racetrack. Rusty last year came here in second position. So what's the difference between being in the title hunt last year and the position you came into this race this year? I said a lot of things to Bill at the end of the year. And I think I was just, I came in that race so pumped up, so excited, wanting to win. And, and I set a goal that I was going to do it. I met every one of the goals. And afterwards, I, I, when I lost, I thought, darn, I wish you just got up and raced with me. You know, come on, get up here. And I was bitter about it. Now I understand a lot more where he's coming from. But then again, I don't know if Bill Stroke or if his car just wasn't running as well as he wanted to run. That's what I really want to believe. And if that's the case, uh, I understand more of what happened and why I'd done. And, uh, and I, I guess I just need to apologize for a lot of the hardcore statements I said. Because now I'm in that same position, I understand it's a different type of pressure. I can tell you it's much, much easier uh, being behind in the points because I know what I'd do. I'd go out here and I'd mow this whole field down and I'd win. And uh, that's what I plan on doing. But then again, I don't want to run the engine so hard I got a chance of blowing it up. I've got uh, a good enough lead right now I can afford to have a little bit of insurance. But that's not what my fans want to see. They want to see the hard driving Rusty Wallace up front, tires are blazing, going to the front. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the tires of blazing, but hopefully you'll see me up front. Well, he is not up front, but he is up front enough to win the Winston Cup at the moment. He is running in 15th position. It has been a struggle for him. I wouldn't necessarily say that he has stroked it all day because uh, that car has just not been up to speed for most no, of the afternoon. No, I don't think Rusty Wallace has stroked today. I think he's basically performed as well as a car would. But, you know, with a championship in mind, I'm sure they made a lot of changes to the car that rendered it ineffective the way it is schedule pit stops is what has put him behind. He hasn't run as fast as Dale Earnhardt has, but he has run faster than many of those that are in front of him. We got running his 12, excuse me, Bob, we're running one race for a point championship. As I said, back in 1973, it all boiled down to one race. And you, I, there's no words to describe how tough it is. There's no, I just can't tell you. When he comes down this time, there will complete lap number 316. 12 more laps to go for Rusty Wallace before he wins the Winston Cup for 1989. Dale Earnhardt continues to be the leader of the race. And Dale Earnhardt is in the straight, same straightaway with Rusty. When Rusty looks in his rearview mirror now, going down the back straightaway, just then he saw Dale Earnhardt. And I kind of... I think that he probably wants to keep Earnhardt from passing that other time. It probably would be wise just to slow down a little bit and let Earnhardt go, but you know, your pride your, will not let you just move over and let your competitor go by you. Now we're showing you how far Dale Earnhardt is behind Rusty Wallace. Not very far, really. Ten laps to go. Ten laps to go in the 1989 Winston Cup season. It'll be all over until... Daytona Speed Weeks of 1990. Will ESPN be back in 1990? You bet we will. We'll be at Rockingham and have the same races that we've had this year on air. Rusty Wallace, just nine more laps now. Nine more for a million dollars and a trophy that says you are the 1989 Winston Cup champion. Rusty Wallace won his first race of 1989 at Rockingham. He won at Richmond. He won at Bristol, Watkins Glen, Michigan, and Richmond. He's not going to win this race here this afternoon, but he could very well be the Winston Cup champion. There are eight laps to go. There is Barry Dotson, the crew chief on the car. Say a prayer. 
saying a prayer. Hoping that the next eight laps go very quickly. There is Richard Childress, who is giving instructions to his driver. Dale Earnhardt, you've done everything you possibly could this afternoon to win the Winston Cup. You have dominated this race probably as much as any race we have seen this year. It sure has. It's reminiscent of Dover back in September. By the way, Bob Jenkins, it has been a fantastic year for me. I've enjoyed it very much. Ned, Jerry Punch, Dick Bergen, and Jack Aroop, and all you guys down in the truck, everybody at ESPN. Thanks so much for making my first year doing this a very enjoyable year. Well, it's been a pleasure working with both you and Ned and uh, Jerry and all the other guys on the crew. It's, uh, it's a hectic schedule we keep, but uh, we have a lot of fun doing this. It'll get better, Barry. Cheer up. Boy, that, that, it is a tense moment for the crew, Wallace, knowing that all they got to do is make six more laps. Six more laps is all he needs. What's he hearing inside that car, Benny? <laughs> he, he's hearing every stone that comes up above the noise of the exhaust. He's hearing every stone that comes up in his floor fan. He's hearing everything that could possibly happen that's ever happened in his life. That dirt track 15 years ago, he remembers that thing and put him out of the race. Could that be the thing that's going to put him out of this race? Let's go to Jerry Punch with Barry Dotson. As you watch Barry Dotson on the wall, he is watching a driver who will make all their dreams come true. Just a moment ago, Barry leaned down, put his hand on my shoulder. His whole arm was shaking. His whole body is quivering here. He cannot stand what's happened in these last few laps. They have waited so long. And the entire Kodiak crew now lines up along the wall and looks to their right, watching turn four, watching for their driver come down and win possibly at Winston Cup time. Just four more laps to go. Dale Earnhardt again continues to lead. And Dale Earnhardt is doing and is about to do exactly what Rusty Wallace did last year as far as coming here, winning the race, picking up as much points as he possibly could. But he's going to fall short in his bid for the Winston Cup. It's unbelievable how 1989 is parallel in 1988 as far as this last race, the Atlanta Journal 500. 325 laps on the scoreboard. Three more laps. Three more, and Dale Earnhardt will have won the Atlanta Journal 500, and Rusty Wallace will be the Winston Cup champion if it all stays together for three more laps. If you're just joining us, Mark Martin dropped out of the race with a blown engine and fire in the car. He will finish third in the Winston Cup points, worth $225,000. Dale Earnhardt will win this race and finish second in the points. Next time around, the white flag will be displayed to Dale Earnhardt. last year remember how anguished he was at losing the championship by 24 points if the Dale Earnhardt is going to lose by about 9 or 12 12 white flag one more lap to go for Dale Earnhardt and Rusty Wallace and Rusty Wallace in his bid to become the 1989 Winston Cup champion he is about to put his name in the record books among the greats. Buck Baker, Lee Petty, Joe Weatherly, Ned Jarrett, David Pearson, Bobby Isaac, Benny Parsons, Cale Yarborough, Richard Petty, Bobby Allison, Terry Labonte, Darrell Waltrip, Dale Earnhardt, and Bill Elliott. Here, Here comes, comes the checkered flag. There's the end of the race. Dale Earnhardt wins the Atlanta Journal 500. But Rusty Wallace has become the 1989 Winston Cup champion. Bob, he is the 20th different driver to win the championship since it all started back in 1949. Here comes Rusty Wallace finishing that last lap. It's official now. There he crosses the line. Rusty Wallace wins the Winston Cup. and celebrating Barry Dotson. Congratulations, you are the Winston Cup champions. They are having a moment here.
started together. The crew chief, Barry Dotson and Rusty Wallace, they have worked together for so long, and so long they have waited this moment. They certainly deserve it. Barry, congratulations, partner. Well, I'm not sure we won it. I tell you, the way the day's gone, it's just, uh, I told you a while ago, I said, somebody's testing us. Rusty said, I can't believe it's the way the day's gone. It, we didn't lay back. We did as hard as we could. We just uh, kept having to overcome all kind of obstacles. I just want to thank everybody involved, every individual on the Blue Max team. Uh, say hello to Alan Evelyn back home. They know what I mean. And uh, we love everybody. And I tell you, we got kicked back all year and kept fighting back. And that's why we're champions. <laughs> uh, no doubt about it. Take a look at the cap he's wearing here. It's certainly his fitting. 1989 Winston Cup champion. They came over and put it on. Barry Dotson, congratulations. And all the Kodiak crew, everyone celebrating here on Pit Road as they are, again, congratulating what a supreme effort this Raymond Beetle team has put forth this year. Bob? All right. Thank you very much, Jerry. Congratulations to Barry Dotson and Rusty Wallace. Dale Earnhardt is in victory lane, and we will be talking with him momentarily. Earnhardt with an outstanding performance here this afternoon. And we will go to Victory Lane and talk with the winner of the Atlanta Journal 500 in just a moment as Rusty Wallace takes another Winston Cup victory lap. Wallace has climbed out of his car and now climbs in a convertible for a victory lap around Atlanta International Raceway. He has won the Winston Cup for 1989, finishing in 15th position and ending up 12 points ahead of Dale Earnhardt. Quite a moment for Rusty Wallace as he took a couple of victory laps around the racetrack, then pulled in, jumped on the top of his car, and now has gone into a convertible. Well, let's go to victory lane now for our winner circle interview being brought to you by the Die Hard Battery. Now with more power when you need it most, Dick Bergeron. Well, Dale Earnhardt, you could not have done more than you did today to try to win this championship. Leading so many laps, such a strong run. Well, we did all we could do, uh, you know, uh, just... Just, uh, you know, if he didn't have enough trouble, you know, we, we ran hard as we could go. And, uh, you know, I want to thank everybody for the good job they did today and all year to good wrench guys. And, uh, you know, good year. And it's uh, AC and everybody that helped us this year, they did a good job. And you know, I'd like to thank all my race fans out there. You know, they stood behind us all year. And it's been a good year for us. We're looking forward to Christmas now and the 1990 season. And you still got a smile on your face, jumped out of the car and waved at the crowd, and they gave you a big round of applause. Well, that's all you can do now. You, you know, you're, you win the race, but you run second. So, you know, we did all we could do. If we just hadn't had that bad luck at Charlotte, I think we'd been okay, but yes, don't win championships. Did you know where Rusty was in the last few laps? Well, I knew he was up there in front of me. If I could get another lap on him, whether it made a difference or not, I don't know. But, uh, you know, he, he just uh, didn't have enough bad luck today. <laughs> well, Dale Earnhardt, victory late. He didn't have enough bad luck either, but he had some great luck in order to wind up here. His wife, Teresa's with him. You're going to go hunting tomorrow and let all this go by. Yeah, we're going to go relax now. Okay, Dale Earnhardt's going to take a couple of days off. He's going to get a kiss from his wife right now. Well deserved. Been a great season for Dale Earnhardt. This is the reaction that Rusty Wallace had when he got out of his race car underneath the banner showing him as the 1989 Winston Cup champion. He wasn't a bit happy, was he? <laughs> Let's go to Jerry Punch. Well, you saw Rusty leaping in the air. This is old Whitney, the car that carried him to four out of six wins last year and now has carried him to a Winston Cup championship. Take a look at the top. He tried to take care of this thing all day long and nurse it to 328 laps. And on that final lap, he jumps out, caves the top in, jumped down across the hood, jumped right on top of this big bear's face, and caved the front hood into the Pontiac. I guarantee you this hood will probably live forever in the living room of Rusty Wallace as a memento of his first Winston Cup championship. We'll be coming to Rusty Wallace momentarily as we talk to him. He's taking that victory lap. We'll be back here in just a moment, and we'll get him out and talk to Rusty Wallace, 1989 Winston Cup champion. All right, there is Rusty in the convertible taking the victory lap. Our top 20 finishers, Dale Earnhardt, Ken Schrader, Jeff Bodine, Sterling Marlin, and Daryl Waldrop. Six through 10, Kyle Petty, Bobby Hill, and Morgan Shepard, Neil Bonnet, and Lake Speed. Finishing at 11th was Derek Cope. Ernie Urban was 12th. Alan Kowicki, 13th. Ricky Rudd, 14th. And Rusty Wallace finished 15th. Then 16th, Dale Jarrett, followed by Harry Gant, Rick Wilson, Larry Pearson, and Hud Strickland. We'll be back with more in a moment. 
change in the top five. Dale Earnhardt Lee uh, was the winner. Jeff Bodine finished second, followed by Sterling Marlin, then Ken Schrader and Darrell Waltrip. The top five finishers in the Atlanta Journal 500. Our continues. Rusty Wallace still in the convertible, being taken around Atlanta International Raceway. He has won the Winston Cup for 1989. Let's go down for a conversation with Richard Childress. Well, it was a good day and a good year, and you came ever so close. Yeah, you know, uh, I'd like to congratulate Raymond Beadle and, her, and Rusty Wallace and her whole crew. And, uh, you know, I think uh, we've had a great year. You know, as Chevy uh, Lumina, it did the job for us today. And with our sponsor, GM Goodrich, behind us, they're going to know we're going to be back next year. What sort of conversations were you having with Dale in the final laps? Mostly just his uh, speed between him and Schrader. You know, we was just trying to win the race. We knew we had to win the race to... Uh, get everything accomplished and we was right at the end was just concerned with Schrader. We never talked so much about, you know, where Rusty was. We never even talked where he was or whatever. Wherever he fell, that's the way it was going to go. This a happy moment, bittersweet moment. What's it like for you? Well, you know, yeah, in a way, you know, we've, we're tickled best we'd won the race, but, you know, we're a little disappointed on the championship. But we come in here behind and we got this close. We're still proud. I'm proud of the whole team and Dale Earnhardt and this great GM Goodrich Chevrolet. Nothing more you could do today. No, we've done all we could do when we came here. They sure did, and they wound up in victory lane, but without the championship, Bob. All right, and we're still waiting for Rusty Wallace to complete his victory laps. When he does come in, Jerry Punch will be talking with him, the new 1989 Winston Cup champion, Rusty Wallace. You're looking at the 1989 Winston Cup champion, Rusty Wallace, and Rusty, congratulations, partner. Man, I'll tell you what, I, they never said it was going to come easy, and it sure didn't. The car just, uh, I started off and I thought I really had a dominant car uh, early going there when I got ready to go. But, uh, man, she was loose. Things weren't right. And then on the first pit stop, uh, we came in. As soon as we came in, a caution flew and we got a lap down. And then I went out and the doggone thing, I had a flat tire. And then I came back in and I had a loose lug nuts. I got two or three down and it's just like it was going to, it's like it wasn't meant to be, you know. And this Kodiak Pontiac runs so strong all the time. It was so darn fast and we missed a day. We, did, we missed... Uh, not too bad. We just got it. So, I mean, 12 points, man. I'll tell you, I, I lost by 24. Dale lost by 12 today. And uh, I'm glad he won the race, and I'm glad I won the championship. Just a perfect year. Barry told us someone, he said someone here just didn't want to give us, make it easy for us today. That left rear tire when you came in, when they had the lug nuts loose and the thing began to vibrate, uh, that, that could have cost you the championship. It could, but uh, we got real lucky there because when we got the tires back on, it was the best set of tires I've had all day long. And the car handled absolutely perfect from there on out. And they were giving my intervals between me and Dale on us, pulling away from him just a little bit. I jump out in front of him to try to get my lap back, and I lead him for about six. That left rear tire when you came in, when they had the lug nuts loose and the thing began to vibrate, uh, that, that could have cost you the championship. It could, but uh, we got real lucky there because when we got the tires back on, it was the best set of tires I've had all day long. And the car handled absolutely perfect from there on out, and they were giving my intervals between me and Dale on us, pulling away from him just a little bit. I jump out in front of him to try to get my lap back, and I lead him for about six, eight laps, and he'd come and get me again. I drove my guts out, do everything I could, and, uh, cause man, I wanted to win this thing. I wanted to win the race and the championship and everything, but hey, I'm not greedy, I'll take the championship. I'd like to thank Goodyear, Kodiak, Mobile One, AC Spark Plugs, and all the sponsors, Oakwood Homes, Mac Tools, everybody with, for what they did for us this year. At the beginning of the show, we said his career began here in Atlanta on March of 1980. One away to close out the decade, Rusty Wallace wins it where it all began, the 1989 Winston Cup champion. And our congratulations from all of us here at ESPN to Rusty Wallace, who won the championship here this afternoon. Well, soccer is coming up next here on ESPN. And at 8 o'clock tonight, the Colts and the Jets, NFL here on ESPN. It's been a wonderful, memorable year for us here at ESPN in the 1989 Winston Cup season. Here are a few memorable moments from the season just past. of the year here at Atlanta this afternoon. Dale Earnhardt won the Atlanta Journal 500, dominating the race. But the Winston Cup champion was Rusty Wallace, finishing in 15th position. Thanks to many people, including Neil Goldberg, producer, Mike Wells, director, Peter Engelhardt, the coordinating producer of ESPN's Auto Racing. And of course, to Ned